Good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the 29th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. And can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. We have no apologies, we have a full house with us this morning, um, and we move to agenda item one. And the committee will take evidence on uh, the Housing Amendment Scotland Bill, uh, at stage one. So can I therefore welcome, and I'll go through all our witnesses uh, together, uh, George Walker, Chair, and Michael Cameron, Chief Executive of the Scottish Housing Regulator, Sally Thomas, Chief Executive, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, David Bookbinder, Director, Glasgow West of Scotland Forum of Housing Associations, Darren Fitzhenry, Scottish Information Commissioner, and John Marr, Senior Policy Advisor, UK finance. So uh, thank you everyone for coming along. We'll move straight to, to questions. And I think we're we'll quite structured today in asking the questions because it's quite a technical bill that we have before us. But that said, we always start off with a very general question. Um, so that said, uh, can I ask witnesses whether they agree with the Scottish Government's policy intention to ensure that ONS can reclassify RSLs as private bodies? Uh, in particular, what would the implications be if RSLs were not reclassified as private bodies. So everything else works around that premise that the policy intent is correct. So we should get some of that on the record. Who would like to go first? Uh, Mr Bookbinder. Thank you. Um, I think there's widespread recognition, certainly within the housing association sector, but I think well beyond that, that this, this is a necessary bill and that the steps are necessary. Day to day, the reclassification, uh, thankfully, hasn't had an impact on the way uh, housing associations run their run their business. Ultimately, uh, as the committee will be aware, it's about how housing association debt is treated and, and having to be treated as Scottish government debt if we don't get a reversal of that decision. That treatment of debt would be a bad thing at any time. It's a really bad thing at a time when there's such a, ramp, a welcome uh, and hugely ramped up development uh, programme. So we may, in, in, I, I know a number of us have kind of whimsically wondered how and why we've, we've all spent so much time, uh, all of us as, uh, as, as, as bodies here today and the Scottish Government too, dealing with this when we look down south at, at what's just happened uh, in the last week or two, a reversal of the, of the decision and you kind of wonder about all that time and effort but, but we know it's absolutely necessary uh, just purely in terms of the debt. There are issues that a number of us will want to take forward in, in, in discussions, particularly with the regulator, about, about looking at a, a slightly different kind of regulatory regime. But I don't think there's much doubt within the sector uh, about this bill being very necessary. Um, and, and implications if the bill wasn't, if, if, if the bodies weren't reclassified, what the implications would be? I, I, the, the, ob the obvious one is the, Im the impact on the development programme. I don't think we could build 50,000 homes because some of the, so much of the money would, be, would be, have to be set aside to, to set against our uh, uh, association's borrowing. There's also, I might add, particularly as a representative of community-based uh, housing associations, that there's, there's a real feeling amongst, um, amongst associations, certainly in, in, in our sector, I suspect it's shared across Scotland in, in the sector, that uh, housing associations truly are not uh, public public bodies, yes, they benefit from public money uh, and perform a number of public functions, but they're managed by voluntary voluntary committees and boards, uh, and that that symbolic sense of although this is only a statistical uh, a reclassification, it still means something. Uh, it, it will feel better to be reclassified back into being into being private, even though private itself doesn't doesn't necessarily do us justice but okay thank you sally thomas yes, I think I'd like to by follow Walker. on with that by um reiterating uh the point that david's made that um uh, sfha is absolutely of the view that this um, reversal of the reclassification is necessary and i think there are two points that i'd like to make in that respect one is that it protects uh, the, the interests and the ambitions of the Scottish Government in terms of uh, the housing programme, and that has uh, cross-party support as far as I understand it. Um, so the 
housing the people of Scotland need and deserve is going to be protected if we reclassify, if we re reverse the reclassification. Um, and I think it also provides assurance to lenders. Uh, the lending industry is absolutely critical to that programme, uh, to the ability of housing associations and cooperatives to be able to build, to be able to build at scale and to be able to build, to build within a time, a time frame that's going to be appropriate to the needs of the population. Um, we also think that um, it achieves a level playing field across the UK, which is important again in terms of the lending industry and the um, financial profile, um, and uh, gives us the, um, uh, the, the sector, the headroom that we need alongside the lending industry to be able to fund the programme uh, that, that we need to provide um, uh, in the coming period. George Walker. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we absolutely agree that this is the, uh, an appropriate, right and proper response. And ultimately, while SHR, of course, will operate within any legislation that Parliament lays down for us, this feels to us like a, an absolutely proportionate um, bill and, and will deal with the, the issues at hand. Um, I think the thing that the point that I would want to make very clear is that our statutory objectives and functions as a regulator are not impeded um, uh, or changed uh, by this bill. Now, whilst there are certain elements that, that mean we will have to operate in different ways, we are broadly comfortable that we can do that. And indeed, the coincidence of us doing a regulatory framework review, which I think we, we flagged up last time we visited the committee, uh, is very fortunate because it means that we can take into account in that framework review the issues that the legislation raises. So we're very comfortable with the approach being taken. Thank you very much. John Marr. Thank you, yes. Just picking up uh, points made there by, by Sally and George and speaking uh, as, as the trade body that represents um, our members who are commercial funders and investors to the RSL sector in Scotland, uh, we certainly agree that, uh, that, that it's appropriate to take this legislation through uh, the Parliament and having had a look um, in detail through the proposals, we see that there are uh, broadly consistent with measures which have been taken elsewhere. Um, I think they're proportionate, proportionate to the challenges which um, the ONS decision has set. Um, and certainly in order to protect and safeguard um, existing and future uh, investment into the sector, um, we, we certainly recognise the strength of regulation. Um, and, and although this bill will make changes to regulation on how it works in Scotland, we're confident that those changes um, should still enable the regulator to, to deliver an effective um, regulatory function. Darlfitz Henry, would you like to add to that? Uh, yes. Well, while I, obviously I note the policy intention behind uh, the bill, uh, our concern is that uh, the committee uh, should be mindful of potential unintended second order effects from the terms uh, of the bill, and in particular in relation to the field of freedom of information, the uh, possibility that um, bodies which are currently subject to the environmental information regulations would potentially seek, cease to be subject to those regulations. Uh, and the issue, therefore, is how that is managed and how the bill uh, addresses uh, this. What it would do, potentially, is uh, create uncertainty where there's currently a, cert, uh, a current certain arrangement whereby uh, RSLs are subject to the environmental information regulations. Uh, and our concern is that if that's not uh, recognised and addressed, then current rights to information would uh, potentially be lost and at the very least uncertainty would be caused as to whether or not organisations were subject to those. That's helpful. Another one of my colleagues wants to pursue that a little bit further in a moment. But just before we move on, the general policy intent seems to be accepted by, by the witnesses. So the other obvious thing to ask before we move into a bit more detail is was there any other way that the policy intention could have been secured? Is there anything other than legislative changes that could have been done rather than this mechanism uh, to make sure that we conform appropriately with ONS requirements? There may not be, but it's, we want to make sure that yeah, this is the, the, the no. only mechanism in town, if you like. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think uh, absolutely. I mean, you just said it. Yeah, I think for, from our point of view, it's the only way to do what we need to do to get the protection and reassurance and um, benefits that, that we need as a sector, but also the government needs and uh, we need as a country. OK, thank you. Any divergent views in relation to that? I'll get everyone to just see the same thing again. Any, anyone not agree with, with that? OK, that's a very helpful scene setting uh, for the committee. Uh, we'll move to some more detailed questions now. Andy Whiteman. Uh, 
Thanks, Convener. Um, and this is a question specifically for Mr Fitzhenry. Um, uh, you've laid out in your evidence the uh, risks you see to the um, applicability of environmental information regulations to, to RSLs. Um, you, your decisions, in, in your decision notice on the Dun Britain Housing Association, uh, you make your rulings, or it was your predecessor who made the specific ruling, but your office makes this ruling in the context of your legislation, uh, which you helpfully append um, in terms of environmental regulations 2004. I suppose my question is, now that it's clear that the ONS um, uh, has re has intends to reclassify unless this bill goes through, and assuming this bill goes through, and we relax the extent to which um, the regulator regulates its sector such that the ONS is satisfied that this is no longer a public body, are you free <clears throat> to interpret the environmental information regulations in relation to what is a public body in a different way to what the ONS is? Or do you feel that you can't really deviate for two different statutory purposes? We certainly wouldn't be bound by the ONS view in relation to that. However, we would be obviously bound by the terms of our legislation, and we would have to take uh, a reasonable and rational interpretation of, of the regulations. Uh, the issue concerned is that one of the key uh, definitions that we have to look at is the, whether the uh, body is under the control of a public body. Now, the issues that are specifically being addressed in this bill are specifically addressed to reduce the level of control. So at the very least, I can say that the argument that there would be control has, will be reduced. I can't, I can't bound myself to a decision uh, at this stage because that will depend on the facts presented to me. It will depend on the legislation at that time, including any subordinate legislation dealing with local authorities. So uh, we're left in the position, however, whereby we can safely say that the current clear position will be left left at the very least less clear and potentially the right could be lost. I mean, there may be other reasons. I mean, you could also perhaps there may be an argument under a different uh, subparagraph of the regulations to argue that it's another Scottish authority. But again, there's no precedent in relation to that. We're creating a lack of clarity for at least a period of time. Uh, and I'd mentioned in my uh, written evidence, uh, Mr Reitman, that uh, the situation could be resolved uh, depending upon the uh, potential extension of a Section 5 order uh, for the Freedom of Information Scotland Act, which would fill uh, the gap and make uh, RSLs subject to the Freedom of Information legislation, including the uh, EIRs. The potential issue, however, is the timing of that in that even if the extension were made, there could still be a lacuna in terms of time between the implementation of a, a potential Housing Amendment Scotland Act and the commencement of Section 5 order. Okay, okay that's helpful. And um, I mean, as you say, I mean, your environmental information regulations talk about a person, a public body, under the control of a person or body. Um, so clearly, the regulator still exercises a degree of control, um, and, and presumably, in in practical terms, um, you would, if if this bill were to pass, in practical terms, you would await an application uh, or an appeal to you for a failure to provide information under the EIR, and you would take a fresh view on whether, in fact, they are bound by it. That's, that's, that's correct. That's exactly right. And that that decision. Um, would then be appealable as a matter of law in terms of your interpretation of the EIR to the Court of Session. The court of session. So ultimately, the Court of Session would rule on the, the powers you have to determine that question. Sh should my decision be appealed, yes. Should your decision uh, be appealed. In relation to the Dumbritton case, my understanding is that was never appealed further. Yeah. Uh, do, so you, do, you have a, do you have any sense of, um, apologies if this is in your evidence, of how many um, freedom of information requests are made, not, not appealed to yourself, but are, are made under EIR to RSLs? Unfortunately, we, we don't. We don't currently gather that information. It's a matter that I've, I've looked at and discussed with uh, my team with, with uh, a view to seeing how we can start uh, gathering that as, as a particular data source. Uh, what we can say is that if there is uncertainty, then people may uh, not be able to access information relating to, the, for example, the types and specifications of materials used in buildings, repairs commissioned, 
health and safety or fire safety, uh, fire safety assessments. So, so there could be uh, an impact. And where there is uncertainty, there almost certainly will be at least some impact, at least with some housing associations who take a different view uh, compared with others. Uh, and in terms of the likelihood of the impact, uh, the number of EIR requests across the board are, are in the region of 7,500 in the past year. So uh, th there certainly would be some uh, impact uh, perceived. And I think, importantly, there is also a perceptional impact. There is a perceptional impact that when things get a bit difficult and we're looking to make changes, if information and the provision of information is seen as being the quick fix which can be discarded or put at risk, then I think there's a very clear perceptional impact in terms of uh, the legislation and what message is being put forward. I think Mr. Goodbye, make some comments in relation to this area. Thank you. It may just be a, a, a and a question of being able to offer the committee some reassurance uh, on, on the concern that that Darren's raised. Obviously, we're all we're all um, it's speculative at the moment. Whilst we await the outcome of of, of the um, uh, the decision, effectively on extension of of, of FOI to to housing associations, but. Um, were, were that decision to be to extend uh, uh, FOI at, 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 a, at a date as yet unknown in the future? And if there is a gap, if that happened and there was a gap between the bill becoming uh, coming into force, as Darren says, and FOI coming into force, I think what we would say, what we would uh, have great faith in our, in our members that, given that they're already subject to the EIRs, and that they, if FOI is coming in, then that will cement uh, uh, and extend that, that they, ju they, they carry on responding to requests, even if it's not under the letter of the law, that they just carry on uh, responding uh, as, it, as, it, as if uh, EIRs were still there. So if there is a, wee if there is a small uh, uh, time lag uh, a gap, I, I, I don't think our members will suddenly think, oh, wow, we don't have to answer any questions about our, our repair service anymore. Um, Sally Thomas, I, I would absolutely um, go along with that. We would take exactly the same uh, position. And I think it's, it's interesting to reflect that um, in the kind of transitional uh, or kind of um, uh, standstill period between um, the uh, ONS uh, reclassification and now the reversal of it, which has been a year or two, something like that, um, there's been an agreement amongst all interested parties that for, 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 for the purposes of what we need to do, we carry on um, uh, as if um, uh, as, as we did before. In other words, we don't suddenly depart from our, our kind of normal relationships, the processes, strategies agreements, expectations and requirements. We carry on as previously until there is clarification and we carry on as previously in a constructive and positive way. That's helpful. Uh, Dan Fitzhenry. First of all, I appreciate very much the, the, the intent uh, from, from uh, both previous speakers uh, on that point. I, I think just the one issue that, that I have to raise in relation to that is that although uh, they may uh, wish to comply with the spirit, ultimately if uh, an appeal comes to me and I feel that I'm bound uh, not to hold them to be uh, subject to the EIRs, then there would be no appeal in law to me. I'd be unable to grant any redress in relation to a decision which uh, the applicant had uh, disagreed with. So I think still there is a, a practical uh, risk. Um, I, I don't know whether a suggestion as, as to a possible uh, remedy to that would be uh, welcomed by the committee. Uh, it's just in relation to a potential consideration uh, of an additional provision whereby it's made clear uh, in the legislation that the EIRs uh, would uh, apply to, to RSLs. Now, potentially that could be a, a new provision uh, in a bill stating that they were to be treated uh, as Scottish public authorities for the purposes of the, the EIRs or potentially a, a consequential amendment uh, to the EIRs themselves, uh, either specifically adding them within the definition uh, of Scottish public authorities or, or by reference to, to a schedule. I, I simply mention that as, as a potential uh, solution, subject, of course, to uh, advice from parliamentary council. Yeah, I, I, 
Absolutely, and we, we will we'll have the minister in front of us in a few weeks' time, and we, these are the kind of things we can we can discuss uh, at an evening session there. So that that is very helpful, uh, Mr. Whiteman. Do you want to progress your question? No, that's further? great. I'd like to move on. That's been very helpful, and we'll, we'll obviously reflect on that um, uh, further. It's an important point. Um, I want to move on to sections one and two of the of the bill uh, regarding the appointments of managers, and we've have had evidence um, um, about this from uh, you all. Uh, it's been pointed out, I think, from the regulator that you you think that you'd still be able to um, do what you do at the moment on the very few cases where you've used these powers. This would make in practice no difference. Um, I'm just wondering whether witnesses are content with the proposed changes to the regulator's powers to appoint a manager and to remove and suspend and appoint a manager. And as a matter of principle, are you content? Yeah, there's a variety of, of powers that, that currently exist for the housing regulator just now. So just... Look at it in the broadest sense. Those are being narrowed. Are you, are you content with the narrowing of those powers, uh, Mr. Bookbinder? In some ways, it was interesting that we, when we all got to look at or to remind ourselves what the original powers were, and I, 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 I certainly think from my organisation's point of view, there was an element of. Uh, surprise that the, uh, the, uh, the breadth of the original powers uh, um, and I, the forum is certainly confident that where uh, manage, statutory managers have been appointed in, 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 within this framework uh, in recent years, uh, it has been for much, much narrower purposes of, 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 of very seri serious issues happening within a, a small minority of associations rather, rather than the regulator turning to those original, uh, rather broad uh, 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 criteria. Uh, so, in a sense, we think that, that uh, what's in the bill reflects actual practice uh, in narrowing those, those, those criteria. That's helpful. Um, John Marr? Thank you. I think um, when uh, when the provisions were first uh, drafted and, and we were engaging with uh, government uh, on their development, we were initially concerned about the threshold of intervention uh, being defined as um, uh, an organisation uh, having failed or rather than is failing. Uh, and we expressed a concern that perhaps that might be too late. In other words, the problem could have... Um, Trans transition through into an actual uh, failure before intervention could occur. But uh, I think as a, as a result of our engagement and the relatively wide definition of failure, if you like, that's included in the legislation now, um, those concerns have largely been addressed. But you'll see in our evidence that we did suggest um, perhaps consideration to including on the face of the bill um, a specific element of the definition to make it quite clear um, that uh, failure included a failure to meet some of the requirements under the uh, regulatory framework. And I think the reason for us suggesting that uh, is that whilst um, lenders and investors who are familiar with the sector and with how regulation works would be able to see the link through from the face of the bill to that definition of encompassing a failure to meet a regulatory requirement. Um, there's a potential for, I think, less familiar investors, investors who might be contemplating coming into the market here in Scotland, those who are distant perhaps at the moment and not so familiar, might not be able to quite so easily make that link um, and that could cause some degree of reticence perhaps um, in their decisions about whether or not to step into the market. Thank you. Sally Thomas? Yes, I think um, uh, for us this is about um, uh, minimising risk. Uh, I think we're probably that's something that we'd all um, agree on. And um, certainly we want to uh, work closely with the regulator, we already do, um, and with other colleagues, uh, to make sure that um, the impact of this change, if it, uh, if it happens, is, is certainly not to increase risk, and it is to, to minimise it and to work on minimising it and giving that assurance and confidence um, that, that, we, that we need to do collectively um, to our individual constitu constituencies, but also, also collectively as a whole, uh, to make sure that, um, that the changes have a, have a positive effect and don't lead to any great increase in terms of um, concerns, problems, uh, at risk, uh, at risk exposure. Thank you. Uh, George Walker. I guess my comment, uh, convener, would be that as, as you know, the new chair of, of the regulator, um, I have been 
it's been very visible to me that the word proportionate in the approach to regulation has been taken very seriously at SHR, and therefore SHR really is only intervening where um, they judge that an issue really is quite serious and intervention is absolutely warranted. Thus far, from my perspective as chair, there's no evidence that, that these changes would have hampered us in any previous cases to step in and intervene in an appropriate manner in the proportionate way that we have. Now, Michael may have a comment, I don't know, on, on, the, the, on past interventions and, and how he feels about that. But thus far, I think the proportionate word is the key one here, because I say, HR has and does and will continue to, to act in a proportionate way, and, and this change won't stop us doing that. Thank you. Michael, did you want to add anything to that? Just to, to emphasise the point that uh, we, we certainly set a high bar for the use of these powers, recognising um, the significance of them, uh, and, and the word proportionate is absolutely to the <laughs> fore of our minds when we are um, considering whether uh, we need to use such powers. Probably just worth uh, uh, picking up on the point around regulatory standards um, and whether it would be helpful to have those in the, uh, on the face of the, uh, the, the bill and then ultimately the Act. Um, well, that would, that would certainly aid clarification or, or, or clarity uh, in that regard. Having read the bill, we're, we're pretty confident um, that um, regulatory standards are, are, are referenced there th in terms of uh, the way the bill is constructed. It, 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 it points to um, statutory provisions uh, and regulatory standards are set through statutory provisions. So um, while, while it would be clearer, um, I think we, we, we're still pretty relaxed um, that regulatory standards are um, the touch point for us in terms of uh, interpreting whether we need to um, intervene in an organisation or not. Okay, thank you very much. Anything you want to follow up on there, Andy Whiteman? Uh, no, I think that's, that's, that's fine. I mean, the, basically, the regulator, you're saying that in practical terms you don't consider this would make any difference to the way you've exercised these powers hitherto, in essence, yeah. And, and just a very brief final point on the regulatory standards question. I mean, forgive me, but are regulatory standards a thing in law? Um, I mean, if you were to put that on the face of the bill, would that demand more articulation about what that really meant if we were to, to follow that recommendation? The, the 2010 Act, as it stands, um, it includes a requirement as to put in place standards um, for governance and financial management for registered yeah. social landlords. So they, they, they're empowered under, under statute. So it would be a relatively straightforward thing if we were minded to think that would be a good thing to recommend? You'd certainly be able to make reference back to yeah. those statutory provisions. OK, thanks. Okay. Just, so just before we move on, Mr Maher, I think you've probably already answered questions around uh, the, the failure uh, of RSL should be clearly defined, including the failure to meet regulatory standards, and we've been kind of talking about that. You did put some stuff on the record. Um, well, we are going to ask some, something about more detail in relation to where you, th you thought it might impact an investor confidence with a number of questions around that, you put a lot on the record already. So before we move on, is there anything I would like to add? Uh, well, I think I mean just just picking up um, uh, the, the point there, the regulator being you know quite comfortable that um, regulatory standards are you know the touch point. Um, Except, you know, the, the points that have been that have been made there, uh, and possibly as part of um, consideration about how or whether or not to address the point, it may be that um, the explanatory notes to the bill could be elaborated to to you know include that reference more specifically uh, if it's felt that the place for it isn't necessarily on the face of the bill. So we can add that into the mix as well. I think that's been a very useful exchange uh, during this evidence session, so thank you very much. We'll move on now to Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Uh, following on from some of the questioning we've had from the regulator, can I look at the, the loss uh, and the removal of the, the consent powers uh, and, uh, and how will that result in a loss of regulatory intelligence going forward? If I can have some sort of clarity on that, that would be useful. Certainly. Um, at the moment, um, uh, all uh, registered social landlords are required to come to us to, for our consent in relation to certain disposals uh, and also to certain constitutional changes. Um, where they do that, they, they will present um, a business case uh, and that will include a series of documentations depending on what the particular um, consent request uh, relates to. Um, that, that will um, enable us to have an engagement with the organisation 
Um, and in addition to um, ensuring that we are able to proceed with the consent, it gives us a better understanding of how the organisation conducts its business, uh, governs um, itself. So it gives us that level of assurance um, that means we don't need to engage with that organisation in any other way um, to, to be able to be content that the organisation is well governed and, and appropriately managed. And, and then, probably following on from that, you've touched on the, the level of risk that we have uh, in the whole process. Uh, so, how would you address the increased level of risk uh, for housing sector as a result of the changes that are going to be implemented? Um, George previously um, touched on the fact that we, are, um, we have initiated a, a review of the regulatory framework and we'll give um, consideration to exactly how we will be able to use the existing powers or the remaining powers that we have to ensure that we are able to obtain the same level of assurance um, from landlords and to, to, to act where we need to act um, um, to ensure that the interests of tenants and other service users are protected. Um, so we'll look, look, at, look at that. I mean, I think an important point here to, to reference is that while there are certain powers being removed or changed, um, we are certainly picking up no expectation that there should be any reduction in the protections that are offered to tenants and other service users. So we will look at the powers, the full range of powers um, that Parliament gives us um, to ensure that we are able to use those to maintain those levels of protection. Yes, so the safeguards will still be in place in your perception as to going forward? Uh, well, those safeguards that are provided through consents will be removed. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but and, and the removal of any safeguards from a system inevitably means that there may be more risk yeah. uh, in that system. Uh, we will look to see what we can do through um, our other powers uh, and our approach to regulation that ensures we um, can mitigate where possible any increased level of risk. Okay. And within the, the memorandum, uh, you talk about the potential need for new staff. Uh, to come in to fill that gap, uh, and you talk about the potential of maybe having three additional uh, members of staff, uh, and that, that would have a cost implication to the organisation, and, and you, you comment about up to maybe 176,000 that would be. Uh, so can you just explain a bit more about how that, that, will pro that process will manage going forward? Well, the, the um, identification of three members of staff and the, the, the figure is uh, an attempt to quantify what we think the impact on our resources may be, may not necessarily translate into three uh, actual uh, uh, members of staff being being employed. But that's what we feel would, would be a way to quantify the additional resource requirement that there would be in us to obtain the type of assurance um, that is currently provided through the, uh, the consents framework. We, we may need to do more um, than we would uh, through, through a consent framework, because the consent framework not only provides us with regulatory assurance, it obviously enables us to um, uh, stop things that, that wouldn't be in the interest of tenants and other service users. Um, there's also within um, the consent framework um, the, the provision that ensures that any um, disposal or change um, that, that, that happened without our consent was void. Um, that would no longer be the, the case um, following um, the proposed changes. So there might be more requirement for us to engage with um, organisations where something has happened that shouldn't have happened. OK. Thank you, Convener. Just, just before we move on, can I check? So uh, Alexander Stroop was talking about the intelligence that the housing regulator would get through the system of consent. And as you would know what was going on across the sector regarding, uh, you know, relocating offices, regarding disposal of lands, you get a lot of information that, in theory now, housing associations, uh, RSLs, wouldn't, wouldn't have to inform you about. Would you anticipate that good practice would be that you would still be informed about all of these things and the housing regulator would still take a view of all these things, even if consent wasn't required in statute? That's certainly one of the... Um discussions that we need to have are, um, through the, the framework review as to how we might be able to ensure um, that any loss of safeguards through consents uh, were able to be addressed in other ways, using other powers that, that we have. What, what we're very clear on, though, is that we wouldn't be looking to put in place 
a consent process by proxy. Um, that that's you know if, if Parliament decides that it's removing the consent framework, then then that's how we will operate without um, our consent being required. Um, we will, of course, look at um, um, the need for us to run closer to more organisations um, if we can't rely on the type of assurance that we would have previously received through the consents framework. Okay, what if any other witnesses would have a particular view on that, David Bookbinder? Um, I, th I think it's worth stressing. I think I think both uh, we and SFHA have, have done that in our uh, submissions that uh, consent, you know, it, on a uh, consent for something very significant like like the, the the disposal of, say, more than one more than one property or or, or a, a pattern of, con of of disposal, if you like. Um, in theory, uh, you could be talking about uh, seeking consent or no longer having to seek consent, as the case may be, for converting social rented housing into something else, into into mid market rent, private rent, for that for that matter, or or, or, or simply selling it off. Associations will do will do a, a whole range of their own due diligence. I mean, no no housing association in Scotland gets rid of social housing uh, uh, lightly. Uh, um, it, it happens sporadically uh, uh, in particular tenements, particular closes. It may it may uh, uh, make sense if you've only got one remaining flat in a in a close to get to 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 divest yourself of that. If 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 if, if, if it makes good asset management sense equally uh, acquiring acquiring is, is is equally sensible i would say that it, it, we don't think it's likely at all that there, that, that, that there will be a, a scale cons, uh, disposals to to worry about but if and if we're looking ahead just theoretically if uh, any housing association appeared to be um, making disposals that that in a sense, threatened the, the 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 balance of their own social housing, but had implications for that area as well, and, and indeed uh, for the national scene. I, I think that would become an issue, uh, um, um, not just for the regulator, but but for the Scottish government government as well. I don't envisage that that happening because of the care with which associations consider those really important decisions. Thomas? Yes, I think I'd, I'd just um, add a couple of points to, um, to what Michael and David have been saying. Um, uh, there'll still be a requirement to notify the regulator on completion uh, of any um, uh, uh, disposal of properties or, or restructuring. Um, and there'll be a tenant ballot, of course, still. That, that, there's still a requirement to do that. So with that, that's retained. That's a, helpful protect, a very helpful protection with which we'd all, all agree. Um, uh, so there will still be notification. It's simply the notification will kind of move in terms of time frame. Uh, to, um, uh, so it's not in advance, it's, it's during and after. That's very helpful, and it takes us seamlessly to our next line of question, I suspect, Ms Thomas. Uh, Jenny Goldruth. Good morning to the panel. Uh, David Bookbinder, in your submission to uh, the uh, committee, you state that, again, our main interest has been in seeing tenant consultation and ballots protected where a change of landlord or a group structure moved to a parent body is being proposed. Do you think that the proposed tenant consultation is going to do enough to protect tenants? Yes, I mean, it, it, we, we recognise that, uh, as things stood, the, the current provisions had to go because they were so inex inextricably linked to the to the, the regulator's consents regime. So uh, we, we were certainly uh, 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 particularly keen. The forum had a, 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 a key role in, in extending the ballot provisions in, 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 in the um, 2014 uh, Act for... for to apply equally to, to group structure changes where one association joins a, another association's uh, uh, group structure. Um, we, we, we're certainly um, uh, happy with the provisions as they stand. The, the, I don't think the, the, the legislation, I don't think, in, uh, includes the word ballot, but effectively it is, it is the only way of, uh, as, 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 as the forum sees it, uh, of complying with, with, with the bill's uh, requirements to, to hold a, a ballot and to abide by that by that ballot. So we're, we're happy that those those really important provisions, as Sally has just referred to them, uh, are, are, are indeed protected. And, and just as a follow-up to that, this is perhaps more broad for, for the rest of the panel, the bill obviously proposes to remove um, the need for the regulator to have consent powers, as has been discussed. And do you think that RSLs um, have already robust enough governance arrangements in place which are going to compensate for that? 
pit Sally Thomas? I think that I think that's a that's an absolutely um, a pertinent question. Um, governance um, of housing associations is absolutely fundamental to this, well, to everything and to their success, and to providing um, assurance to tenants that things are being run in the most efficient and effective way, and that taxpayers' money is being made to the best use of. Um, and um, we work very closely with the regulator, with other colleagues, to make sure that governance arrangements that are in place are as the best as they can be. And um, we, I think, well, we certainly appreciate and understand, and I think others do as well, that we're going to have to work even harder at that. That's not to say we're expecting to see governance failures, or we're expecting to see weaker governance, but uh, I think as a result of this, we know that we're going to have to make sure we're on the ball in terms of governance being the absolute best it can in the interests of tenants, in the interests of taxpayers, in the interest of the development programme. Hey, George Walker. Yeah, I, I think the member gets to the, to the heart of the matter. It's, it's, it's a very important question. What is interesting as we go through the, the framework review that we've touched on is that one of the key issues that's emerging from that, and indeed we'll, we'll consult on in the new year, is around the idea of boards assuring themselves. So that self-assurance around this. So I agree with Sally's point. I don't think anyone's expecting you know, certain, an overnight failure of governance with this. But of course, what we will be doing is encouraging boards themselves to make sure they are self-assuring around these issues where consents go. Where it could be in, in the past, there has been that um, you know, appropriate comfort of, of speaking to the regulator to say, you know, is this, is this appropriate and reasonable? Yes or no. When that's not there, that self-assurance and encouraging that will be an important part of the, of the um, consultation we'll bring forward in the new year. Uh, John Marr. Just picking up again points made by, by Sally and George there. I mean, due diligence was mentioned previously in the context of a disposal by an RSL, and it's certainly quite right that um, <clears throat> an RSL board should ensure that it has gone through uh, the required due diligence, due diligence before disposing of any assets. And equally, um, uh, lenders would also uh, you know, go through due diligence as well. Um, and clearly, uh, you know, that can help offset um, any concerns about the loss of um, you know, regulatory and business intelligence. Um, there was a, a mention there of, of, of self-assessment, and I think that that will certainly have a role going forward um, in, in ensuring uh, a degree of comfort across the piece uh, that, that disposals have been made appropriately where they are made. Uh, and we'll certainly look forward to engaging with the regulator further as part of the framework review when some of those proposals come forward in more concrete detail. Okay, thank you. Jenny Gorruth, anything to follow up on? Okay, Katie Leedsmith. Thanks, Convener. I want to follow up on some of what John Marr just said. But just before I do, I wonder if I could ask David Bookbinder specifically to comment on something that was in your submission, if you don't mind. And you said in it that um, the, the provisions may make it more straightforward for sensible changes to be made, where these, for example, will help associations prevent potentially disruptive individuals or groups having undue influence or control over an association's affairs. I wonder if you could comment further on that statement that you made. Yes, I mean, there's, 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 all, there's potentially, and hopefully it's not something that uh, uh, many, many housing associations would ever, would ever encounter, but there's, 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 there's I mean, most housing associations are as keen to see as many people uh, from within their, their, their sort of share membership. Um, uh, uh, well, two things. I, I want to have as many people in the share membership and then want to have uh, as many uh, of those uh, people um, willing uh, from time to time to stand to be on, to be on the board, on the committee. Um, so the, 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 the background issue to this is that uh, uh, a lot of associations are... Um, I wouldn't say crying out, but certainly really, really welcome willingness to stand uh, 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 and um, uh, the attraction of doing that is something that, that we're very, very keen uh, to promote to potential uh, committee and board members. Um, um, every now and again, the, an association might, might encounter... Um, uh, issues where they, 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 want, they may want to change, uh, make a sensible change to, the, to their rules, to their constitution, to their, to the, potentially to their code of conduct uh, for board members. 
Um, and that, and, and uh, the, you know, where there's potentially one or more individuals who, who the association has absolutely sound evidence would not is not there to act in the association's uh, best interests. At the moment, the code of conduct would would enable an association to take action against an existing board member um, who isn't isn't acting it, it isn't felt to be acting in the best interests but not to a not to somebody applying to be a board member so that's something where um, we we know some, some some of our members have been looking at potentially changing their rules now I'm, I, I'm certainly not suggesting that if, if in, in an instance like that and one of our members went to the regulator today and said, is it OK if we do that? I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting the regulator wouldn't uh, engage on that, uh, uh, f uh, far from it. But it's just an example of a kind of a sensible rule change that an association might want to make. Um, it's probably quite a traumatic time uh, for the association and, and cutting out a process of having to go, go through uh, uh, the, the, you know, the consents uh, um, um, mechanism for that would it would would certainly be a help where it's evidently acting in in the interests of the association and it's just cutting out one 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 stage of the process would would would, would be helpful. I don't want to make a big issue about you know that the, the, the our our movement is under threat from lots of people trying to trying to inveigle themselves onto uh, on, on, onto, onto board, but it's just an example of where you know um, a little less red tape would be welcome. I suppose I was just a bit concerned about who judges disruptive behaviour and whether or not that could actually, you know, who, who's making that decision? What is that kind of behaviour or is it just someone making legitimate points that, that the board may not be listening to, taking a different position to the board? And I'm also keen to know under that, and I see Sally Thomas nodding, so perhaps there's something that Sally Thomas would wish to add, but also, you know, are, are the... Are the, RS, are the RSLs very... How, how do you approach making sure that the board is um, made up of... Uh, with, with gender recognition, with recognition of diversity on the board? How do you approach that? I mean, that's, that's something that, that, that is, is a big issue for the movement. Uh, the, 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 the biggest unbalance at the moment, I would, I would, I would uh, hazard, is, is age and the, the, the attempts that many, many associations... Uh, throughout our area and I'm sure throughout Scotland are making to to, to balance up uh, uh, get get some younger people for instance onto onto board so we we always take that very seriously but I think I would make the broad point uh, in relation to your question about how, how you know how do you know, how do we know a board is making the right decision about 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 something I think the reg I, 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 I would say I think the regulator would say that's that's up to the association to get that right uh, the, the the regulator is not going to decide that for you so I think I think in any event that is something that an association has to get right uh, through the experience of his board in having a real sense of what's right for the association going forward yeah, I have, to, I have to say that's an absolutely another, uh, yet another absolutely pertinent question, and, and it's an, uh, and there's no, from my point of view, there's no clear, there's no you know um, exact answer to that because um, uh, uh, board membership, um, uh, how you attract people to boards, uh, how you get a balance, how you get diversity on boards, is an ongoing and major issue for the sector as it is as it is for many many other organisations and sectors, and I think that issue about disruption or challenge. Uh, is, a, is a well made one and uh, it's always going to be the case that it has to be taken um, you know kind of on its merits at the time and, and it's and it's a judgment of, of, of sorts having said that um, the issues around self assurance around um, uh, doing more work on governance making sure that the governance of organizations is, is the best it can be uh, is is front and central of what we need to do in terms of all this going forward um, and um, I think uh, that um, um, that if we do that properly, if we do that in the right way, if we have our, um, have our, our, our ducks in a row and um, have the priorities right on that, then I think we can address the issues that you've raised. But it is an ongoing process. It, it, it's not one that you can safely say is done and dusted and we've done it and we're successful and isn't it all great. It's an ongoing issue. I think the, the other point I'd make is that um, uh, uh, tenant representation on boards is, is, is to SFHA, to... Uh, to Gossoff and I, I think to others, absolutely critical. Uh, coming from England, where tenant representation on boards has been has been run down for a variety of reasons, 
um, it's an absolute pleasure to be in a place where tenant representation is treated as important and increasingly so. Um, and we would want to do everything we can to make sure that is, that is retained. Um, so given um, David's concerns, which I think are, are, are credible and realistic, given your question, which is absolutely pertinent, uh, we need to make sure we can do the best we can to make sure there is tenant representation in the best way possible, that those people are supported to contribute in the best way possible to the governance arrangements. And we take on board and we continually review and reassess the points you've made about achieving good governance, diversity, challenge, um, rather than, than disruption, uh, and we do the best we can in that regard. Yeah, thanks. Um, unless anybody else wants to follow up, I was going to ask John that. Uh, well, okay, you can indulge the convener then, because I, I had something I wanted to follow up with that, but I was try trying not to, uh, but that's helpful. <laughs> there's, a, there's a general theme around, around this where actually housing associations need a little bit of disruption from the same handful of tenants but on the same board for a long period of time and well-paid officials putting through rent increases and rent restructurings and investment programmes that go through rubber stamped um, and it's at what point the board is actually part of the co-production and corporate governance of the organisation and at what point is it actually just putting things through on the nod and I think that's a challenge in the housing association movement incidentally and some housing associations that are superbly run that will also be a challenge it doesn't actually necessarily say that the housing association in itself is poorly run at all so I, I hadn't picked that bit out from Mr Bookbinder's evidence but it did grate with me a little bit when I was hearing about it, because we actually need some really well-qualified, disruptive individuals challenging the housing association movement's senior officers to make sure it's a real tenant-led organisation. So any, observ any observations on that would be welcome. And then we should, of course, move on to Mr Marr. Absolutely fair, fair, fair comment. The, 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 the forum takes very seriously that notion of... Um, committee members, board members, having the having the right ability to to challenge. So let me give you an example. Uh, uh, along with our, our colleagues at, at, at Share, uh, the forum is is about to produce in the next week or so uh, a, a small booklet uh, aimed at, at committee members on on no, no, knowing the basics of, of of sound financial management and knowing when when to challenge and to do so when it's important when you don't understand something when you're uncertain about something to give to give that confidence because uh, lack of challenge is not a well-run housing association and we couldn't we couldn't we could never claim that um, we've also done a piece of work this year on succession planning about uh, being fit for the future about making sure that your committees and boards are, are, are fit for the future and, and having people with the with with the right experience and that certainly includes includes uh, 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 the, 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 the critical local input that you, you can only get from local people. Um, but we take succession planning and good governance really, really seriously. We've produced a lot of work on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for that indulgence, Deputy Convener. I'll oh, move on with your line of questioning now. Thank you, Mr Marr. Um, with specific um, regard to sections three to seven, could you tell us a bit more about the kind of risks that the removal of the regulator's powers of consent could pose for funders. I think you've touched on this previously, but if you could expand a bit more on the kinds of risks. Uh, yes, I think, uh, I mean, we're, we're talking here about um, the transfer from a, a system of consents to a system of notifications, uh, not only, <coughs> excuse me, not only in relation to disposals, but to uh, organisational changes, which could, for instance, be uh, proposals for RSLs to merge or form different um, business structures. Um, we mentioned in the, the, the earlier discussion uh, that um, although uh, notification might mean there could be a degree of loss of regulatory and business intelligence, uh, I think we, we're comforted and we take reassurance from the fact that um, associations through their own due diligence and lenders themselves through the due diligence they undertake and possibly also um, uh, an increased role for self-assessment could help to fill some of the, the, the gaps that, uh, that might arise uh, through, through the change. Um, clearly, uh, in terms of existing uh, loan agreements, there would be uh, provisions within those um, requiring the borrower to seek lender consent for uh, specific events, uh, definitely around 
uh, constitutional changes and uh, you know lenders will still be um, going through that process of um, uh, engagement with their borrowers to provide consent or otherwise to uh, those changes upon merger. Um, so I think uh, even although we are moving um, uh, under the proposed legislation to a new approach, um, lenders can still take comfort, I think, that uh, existing practices in terms of their own um, uh, processes through their loan agreements um, and changes down the line from uh, uh, changes to the regulatory framework um, will provide sufficient reassurance, I think. Okay, thanks. And you, you did say in your written evidence that you expected funders would have to ramp up, your words, their own due diligence. But you also touched on in your answer and in your evidence that um, funders would expect boards to strengthen their own self-assessment regimes. So would that perhaps result in increased costs for RSLs? Uh, there may be um, associated costs with some of these changes. Uh, it's difficult to forecast what they might be from, from this distance out. Um, I, I touched in uh, the evidence we provided about um, lenders ramping up their own due diligence and the possibility of there being costs associated with that. Um, I'd emphasise that these would not be um, changes to costs of funds per se, but uh, more uh, transactional and process costs uh, associated with uh, you know, stri striking a deal. So I wouldn't expect that those would be significant um, uh, in the grand scheme of things, but they would continue, I think, to be proportionate in relation to the deals that are being progressed. OK, um, and uh, perhaps we can maybe just ask the RSL. Yeah, if, if there's any comments that, yeah. they would make, like to make on that. Sally Thomas. Um, yes, I think um, so that the, the question is about a possible cost to boards of increased selfishness. Yes, yes. Uh, which, yes um, absolutely. So um, uh, I think what we'd be hoping to do um, as part of the regulatory review um, alongside David um, and, 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 and John as well, of course, is to... Um, uh, is to try and look at ways where that was limited as much as possible, minimised as much as possible. And the way we'd do that is to try, is SFHA, uh, Gossoff, would, would be trying to uh, provide as much information, advice and support um, to advise uh, and, uh, where necessary, strengthen uh, uh, board uh, activity um, and uh, self-assessment in particular um, at a minimal cost to the organisation. Uh, there's a huge diversity of organisations in the sector, from very small to, to big, um, and clearly the, the ones at the bigger end of the scale can probably do what they need to do themselves within their own means uh, and without a big hit on their resources. Um, but other, others will find it much more difficult um, and, and time-consuming and resource-intensive, proportionally to their size and activity, and we will be uh, making sure that we focus our, our resources um, that we have um, as a support organisation um, to, to make sure that they're targeted in the right way to, as I say, to minimise the cost and effort involved to individual organisations. Okay, Any additional comments before we move on? Uh, uh, we'd just like to welcome, uh, I mean, our, our lenders are our key partners, so I'd just like to welcome John's assurance that any further due diligence would, would indeed be proportionate. That's, of course, now on the record. Not binding, but it's on the record, Mr. Uh, will anything else, Elaine Smith, no, will Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, so a question for Mr. Marr. You make reference in your written submission uh, uh, to a suggestion that should be a sunset clause in Section 8. I wonder if you can expand on that. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> we can quite understand the, the, the rationale for the inclusion of, of, of this power. Certainly at the time that the bill was drafted, um, there was still uh, a fair degree of uncertainty um, about how the ONS might view the provisions and whether or not they would be sufficient to achieve the, the outcome of restoring the private classification. I think now that we've seen the ONS move um, uh, relatively swiftly, south of the border in, in restoring the private classification to English housing associations um, after the Westminster government uh, implemented the final uh, pieces of the, the puzzle in, in the, the, the deregulatory measures of the Housing and Planning Act. And given that those measures are um, you know, broadly 
consistent with the measures in, uh, proposed for Scotland, um, we can perhaps take comfort that implementation of this legislation here um, would enable the ONS to move as quickly as it did um, down south and reverse its decision. Um, and, and that being the case, um, you could say, is this provision, which is open-ended, um, really necessary in the circumstances? Um, our, our concern was that um, including it, and as I say, we understand why it was included, um, but leaving it um, entirely open-ended um, would prolong the uncertainty, um, certainly for uh, investors thinking of coming into the market. Uh, and if in some way the, 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 the period within which the power could be exercised was limited, then that would be helpful. And we'd suggested initially until the end of the current uh, Parliament, but given, given how quickly the ONS has acted down south, it may even be that the, that the power um, isn't necessary, but that's clearly uh, you know, an issue for consideration. Okay. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? It really just does feel like a just-in-case clause, uh, 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 and it, it, I agree with John that it, 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 we've, we've a lot of reason to be confident that, that the ONS will be satisfied with the bill's measures. But it just feels like it, 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 it's got it, it needs. To, we're certainly relaxed about it being there. The way the clauses have been uh, worked up has been very. The Scottish government's acted in a very sort of consultative manner, and I think it would carry on doing that if, in the unlikely event, it had to use this um, this, this sunset clause as, as, as you refer to it. But we're, we're certainly we don't see it as a, as a, as a threat. Uh. Any additional comments? Okay. Um, the delegated powers and law reform uh, committee has made. Uh, some recommendations uh, and one relates to section 8 so if we can just re read it out to you and uh, invite your comments um, it says the scope of the powers extends to permitting any modification of the functions of the regulator which relate to social landlords the power is therefore drawn more broadly than is required to achieve the policy objective and the committee considers that in principle the power could be framed more narrowly in accordance with the policy objective uh, and recommends that the Scottish Government considers this further. Um, any thoughts on that? This might be the first opportunity witnesses have had to hear that, that recommendation within within the report. So I, I, I'm aware we could be catching you cold a little bit on this, Mr Marr. No, I, I think that's, uh, you know, um, a welcome progression uh, to narrowing the the scope within which the power could be uh, could be used. Um, it, it still, I think, leaves the time frame uh, element uh, open, um, which was one of our uh, more significant concerns. So, uh, narrowing the narrowing the scope, yes, time frame still seems to be quite open. Any other reflections? Understanding that report just came out yesterday, so yeah. it's hot off the press generally content with the power if it is required, but good thing to narrow the scope of it a little bit. Mr Mar's already spoken about possibly a sunset clause. I think it's a very th it's a th it's an under it's a theoretical argument that, that on the face of it it, lo it looks a very broad power. I, I, I don't think any of the, the housing association sector believes that, that will be that will be misused. If if it if it if it is uh, uh, prudent to look at, uh, at some na narrowings of it, then 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 so be it. But I think it's important that it's 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 still retained as as a as I referred to earlier, a just in case clause. Okay. Um, so move, moving on to um, section nine of the bill, um, which uh, plans to restrict uh, local authority power of nomination to an RSL board to a maximum of twenty four percent of board members. Um, Inverclyde Council uh, says they're concerned the plans are unduly restrictive and won't allow for the exercise of local discretion for local circumstances. Um, does anyone agree or disagree with that? So in other words, they're saying that re restricting it to 24% is too restrictive. 
the forum has any m member this this generally is something as you as the committee will know will uh, applies to stock transfer of the probably the largest stock transfer associations where uh, having a proportion of, of local authority uh, elected members was was part of the of the transfer arrangements um so uh, it may be for others 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 to comment um we're not it's not as if we're going from something that's saying you can't have 50 you know you must come back down from your 51 percent lower it, it, it we we're talking about nuances here between a third and a quarter and I, I, I would have thought that you know um, even under the current arrange you know under the under the proposed new arrangements that there's still influence there from 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 local authority members as though as there would be under the the current 33 percent sort of uh, a, a arrangement so I think it's um, I, I, th I think it's it, 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 it's it's clutching at straws really to say this will make a big difference especially as if if we believe the ONS needs this change to happen it's Ali Thomas yes yeah I, th I think we'd be uh, we'd be looking for the essentially good relationships between local authorities and housing associations to to pick this up um, essentially so um, while it might appear to be um, a loss in some senses I would hope certainly we would hope as an organization that the uh, that the relationships between local authorities and housing associations are sufficiently good to be able to work that out between them in conversation discussion uh, and if there needs to be um, if there is it is felt helpful from both parties to have representation on boards of local authorities then then so be it I mean it's up to the individual housing association local authority to work that out I think that's just as it should be okay thank you any additional comments on that well, you want to ask a question on this specific matter, Elaine? Yeah, but I don't want yeah. to stop Graham from asking so you, on this, on this, so on this specific point, you want to yeah, speak this one a bit further? I just wonder whether you, uh, any of you think it's appropriate that ministers should, you know, should have the power to, to set this limit in the first place. <coughs> no one's grabbing at that one. Maybe a bit of clarity. Do you mean that it, it, well, it should be open ended? How many? Yeah. Should should they be able to, you know, set this limit of twenty four percent, whatever whatever the figure should be? Is that is that right? Uh, can, Sorry can I, for all these tough questions. Can, can I can I well, can I just clarify just so we, we, we so we get an answer back that fits in with the policy intent of the bill? My understanding, and it's always dangerous trying to understand something as convener of this committee, is that the the reason for the restrictions was to better conform with ONS requirements for RSLs to be seen as private bodies and reduce the influence of other public bodies on it. So does that mean there has to be a cap somewhere down the line? And then Mr Simpson's question about why should that be specified, specified at all by government? There still might be no takers for this, Mr. Simpson. I don't know. I think ideally Mr. we would not want uh, ministers to be dictating how, how our boards are structured. I think in this case we think it's probably a proportionate response to, to the requirement, uh, as the convener has said, for ONS to see this happen, to see the, re the, the perceived reduction in public influence or control uh, happen. No other comment. I, I should have said my questions in advance, convener, I think. Uh, no further. Elena, on, the, on this point, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Um, having served in the Parliament since 1999, I was actually um, in the Parliament when stock transfer legislation was going through and concerns were raised at that time by myself and actually my then colleague John McCallion about the fact that stock transfer could just be seen as privatising a public asset, which clearly was previously council housing owned in the public sector by all of us as the public. And so now I suppose we come to a situation where uh, we're taking that even a step further. And at that time, that would have been why there was um, uh, th there was uh, concerns about how you know local authorities influence on boards to try and bat off that, that accusation of privatisation of a public asset. So my concern now would be that if local authority influence is reduced, then how does that tie in with the, the fact that the local authority in these areas of wholesale stock transfer has the statutory duty towards homeless persons? So what would be the implications for that? And that would be specifically to David Bookbinder and Sally Thomas, but if the regulator wished to comment on that, then Obviously, I'd be happy to hear any comment the regulator has as well. 
okay, a lot in that. Anyone want to go first? It's unfortunately you're directly ahead of Mr Brookbinder, so I, Mr Brookbinder. The sector regarded it as really important, um, in the, in the, especially in the light of stock transfer and six local authorities in Scotland that don't have any stock at all, that there were robust uh, statutory measures uh, uh, um, for housing associations to, to support the local authority in housing a homeless households, so that th that part, Section 5 of the, of the 2001 Act, has, has, has been really important. In, in practice, a lot of local authorities don't resort to using that because the, 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 the more informal nominations and referral arrangements in most parts of Scotland appear to work to work, to work very well, but they were, they were critical and remain critical in ensuring that, 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 that all associations, but particularly those in areas with no council housing, can, can, can make, make a proper um, uh, contribution to, to housing homeless households. That, I suppose my question is, will that still continue to work well if the local authority nomination to, to uh, boards is reduced? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I mean, I have to say the forum doesn't associate the, the success of, of, of housing homeless people locally to the, to the constitution of the board. I don't, I don't see a correlation there uh, uh, at all. Okay. Yes, I think I think the point I'd make, um, and, and it is it is, and it's an important issue because, um, again, the 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 influence and the extent to which um, housing associations um, uh, have um, uh, influence, which represents um, you know democratic processes, uh, the taxpayer, uh, the public, the public good is important. Um, I think what I'd say though is that. Um, uh, for me, there's, um, uh, there's a difference between um, local authority influence possibly being reduced in statute, um, in, in policy terms, as we have here, and reality. So, um, and I, you know, who can second guess this? But what I would hope, and I think what I would anticipate, is that while there might be this provision, uh, which uh, looks ostensibly as if the impact could be to reduce local authority control and influence, the reality of it might not be that at all. might well be that it stays as it is, uh, it's increased possibly, um, and that uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, joint intentions and collaborative aspects of the way that local authorities and housing associations work together and the relationships they've built up since stock transfer, uh, w which are mostly good, I wouldn't want to say they're wholly good, that would be too much to, to, uh, to profess, uh, would mean that, that that level of influence would be retained um, and uh, increased where necessary for the provisions that you've been talking about in terms of achieving reductions in homelessness and uh, housing people who need it. Okay, can I just ask, just given there are percentages being specified, there's a direction of travel here, does anyone r really think there'll be any difference in the good governance of uh, RSL's board or the partnership relationship it does or doesn't have with the local authority based on whether a local authority can appoint 33% of board members or 24%. Is that maybe missing the, missing the concept of engagement partnership completely, perhaps? Uh, yes, Thomas. yes. I, I would... Uh, I, yes, I mean, following on from the point I've just, I've just made, I, I think it... I, I wouldn't want to discount it completely. That would be naive and, 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 and ridiculous to do so. But um, uh, knowing what I know, um, knowing how the sector behaves, knowing what we intend to do going forward uh, collectively and in terms of the sector, that, that uh, the, the relationships in place now and the, um, the kind of historic uh, extent of and development of those relationships over time since stock transfer will mean that we're in a much better place than we, than we ever were then and that the, the partnerships going forward Forward will reflect that and the impact of those partnerships and those relationships going forward on the housing needs and demands we know that are out there will reflect that. Okay, um, I think final question from Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks, Community. I just wanted to pick up a number of points that Gordon uh, Graham Simpson made um, on the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, for which, of course, he's the convener. Um, as indicated, I think the convener indicated this just came out, um, I think, yesterday, and it um, reveals a disagreement between the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee between them and the government as to the Section 8 and Section 9 order-making powers, with the committee feeling that they're too broadly cast, uh, and the government saying, no, we're very content with that, we may need to mop up unanticipated um, feedback from ONS. So, not looking for a response now, but um, if anyone wishes to come back 
um, and comment on the nature of that disagreement and where they feel the balance might be most appropriately set, I think we'd find that very useful. Should point out, um, just I wanted to clarify with the convener of that committee there, obviously the Scottish Government is still to respond to the report that was published yesterday and look at the evidence within that, so that's the context we should view that disagreement in, I suppose. Anyone want to take up the cudgels on that one? No great thirst. <laughs> Sorry, for, for, for me, I think the point that um, um, uh, the members just made about um, uh, having time to reflect and come back on it, I think, is probably the most sensible way forward for, uh, uh, for myself and SFHA. OK. Can I, can I maybe suggest you read the report from, from the committee? Mm. Um, it's I mean, it's all quite technical stuff, obviously, but you know, maybe you want to read it and come back to us. And that's very helpful, Mr Simpson, because our committee will have to take a view on this, so we want to be informed, not just with the report that Mr Simpson's committee has produced, but by your views in relation to that as well. And the Minister, of course, will be before us. Any additional questions from members? OK. Well, can I thank everyone uh, for coming along this morning. Very useful and structured evidence session, which will inform our deliberations at Stage 1. Um, as the offer was just made there, please get back in contact with the committee. There's additional information you want to give, not just in that specific matter, but anything at all. Uh, so thank you once more for uh, your, your time here this morning. And we'll now move briefly to suspend ahead of agenda item two. Thank you. Thank you.
Oi, good morning again, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, we now move to agenda item two, which is draft budget scrutiny 2018-19. The committee will take evidence of the Scottish Government's draft budget 2018-19, and can I therefore welcome Ronnie Hines, Deputy <laughs> Chair, and Fraser McKinley, Controller of Audit Accounts Commission, and Tim Bridal, Manager, Local Government Technical Audit Support. Uh, can I invite Ronnie Hines to make an opening statement before we move to questions? Uh, thank you, Convener, and I, I won't uh, take up much time with that. Um, the report, I hope, is self-explanatory. There's a summary at the beginning with the key points in each of the sections as well. So, really, the only point I wanted to make by way of introduction is that this is the second time um, that we've separated out the financial from the other aspects of uh, local government resources and performance in two reports at different times of the year. And the reason for doing that is that we think it's most helpful to have this information in the public domain at this point in time when the budget cycles in full flow. So it's intended to be informative and helpful, and it's in that spirit that we're here today to try to answer questions around the report. And as I think we did last year, if there's anything, because of the quite um, complex nature of some of the matters to do with local government finance, if there's anything that we're unable to satisfactorily answer today, we'll come back with further information after the, uh, the meeting. That's as much as I wanted to say by way of introduction. Give me enough. Very helpful. We'll move straight to opening questions then. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you uh, very much, um, convener. Thanks for coming along today, and uh, thanks for another um, excellent report. I mean, these, these reports and the, their presentation and their clarity and the language, I think, is, is extremely helpful to us to try and make sense of what's quite a complex landscape. And um, I think some of us were discussing earlier Exhibit 4, an attempt to put in some diagrammatic, simple-to-understand form, the funding formula, which I think some of us are still uh, um, struggling to, to, to get a grip of. But the top line here is, I mean, you issued some stark warnings um, about the um, financial state of local government, notwithstanding you have no, as you know, unqualified um, uh, audits um, on them, or no qualified audits, rather, on them. I mean, how would you view the financial state of local government now in the historical context? Obviously, you can only go as far back as you've been sort of working in this area, but over the last 5, 10, 17 years of devolution, you know, where are we now in regard to the financial state of local government? Well, I think uh, the point you made yourself there about the absence of any qualifications on the accounts um, is not something just to gloss over. It's, it's quite a significant achievement. Although it happens every year, we shouldn't take it for granted. And it's an indication, I think, of the good stewardship of public funds that we continue to see in local government. So I just want to say that because I think it's important. Um, notwithstanding that, and the fact that by and large, uh, councils are able to live within their means, taking one year with another, um, what we see this year is um, an enhancement of the pattern that we've seen in the last few years, which is increasing challenges and difficulties on the part of councils to do that. It's not uniform across the country. The 32 councils each have their own story to tell. Um, but nevertheless, as a general trend, I think, of increasing difficulty, and probably the way that we've highlighted that in this report and was picked up in some of the media coverage yesterday, is that uh, for the first time we've seen a majority of councils um, dipping into their reserves in order to balance their budget in year. Uh, now, that's not, and there's nothing untoward about that. You're perfectly entitled to do that. Um, the thing that we thought was potentially significant is the fact that a majority did that in budgetary and in actual terms in the course of the year uh, that this audit is concerned with. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're at some kind of tipping point. We don't believe that to be the case. It would be far too early to make that kind of judgment. But it does indicate probably that faced with the choice between doing that on the one hand and looking further into the service budgets to make the reductions that were necessary there, they've chosen to use their reserves. And uh, as I say, the majority of now did take that view for the year that we're looking at. So that seems to us to be potentially quite significant. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, I just want to ask a question that I've asked you know, before. I mean, obviously, part of the issue here is about the quantum of the resources that are granted by this parliament through the vote on the budget um, for local government. And that is obviously a matter that will be is before, going to be for us imminently. But in terms of the challenges you see for local government finance, what role do you think uh, could be played by structural change in the way in which local government is financed. I'm thinking more fiscal autonomy, multi-year budgeting, fiscal frameworks, the kind of processes that could be put in place, there are others, to create more um, financial resilience in local government. Because part, as I understand of what you're saying here, part of this is caused by the fact that local government has very little um, 
uh, uh, means at its own disposal to raise revenue and is very much dependent on a, another sphere of government, and that in itself creates tensions. Um, well, a lot of that would go beyond the scope of, of this report and indeed um, the, the work that the Commission does because there will be policy issues concerned in that. So I'll limit myself to the, the aspects that I can safely comment on, I think. One would be um, the, the multi-year budgeting, the forward planning. That's a recommendation that we make repeatedly. And as you see in the report, um, it remains the case that roughly half of councils don't routinely every year roll forward a three-year planning horizon for their revenue budgets, and they don't all do it for capital either. Uh, now, we recognise the difficulties with that, particularly when there's a one-year financial settlement for the largest part of the funding that comes from the Scottish Government. But it's not impossible, otherwise none of them could do it. So we continue to press for all of them to do that and to put their planning on as secure a basis as they can. So that's one um, thing that could be done, even within the, the current arrangements. Um, on the broader picture, um, well, we've just seen the uh, removal in the current financial year of the council tax freeze. And the report touches on that and the way that different councils responded to that. So that does restore a degree of local flexibility that has been largely missing um, for a decade. Um, it's not for us to say whether that's a good or a bad thing, but we do comment on the use that's made of it. And the other point that we make is, and I think this touches on part of your question, um, that even with that in play and a 3% um, ceiling currently imposed on it, um, the council tax freedom doesn't actually make that much of a difference to the overall amount of money that local government spends. Um, I think we compare it in the report to the cost of a 1% pay award for staff. So it would be wrong to get hung up on the idea that by itself council tax, even if the 3% ceiling were removed, uh, would necessarily be the, the magic solution to all of this. Now, it's then for others, I think, to conclude whether um, some continuation of the status quo as it now is, or something else in the wider funding of local government needs to be brought into play, but all we can do is comment on the situation that's, that, that exists. Okay, and just a final question for me. At, at the moment, and it's picking up on the point you've just made about council tax, um, I was interested in paragraph 68 in Exhibit 19, <laughs> looking at council tax in 2017-18 uh, and the impact that the banding reform has made um, and the increase in, 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 in rates ha, uh, has allowed, and also the additional income from discounts on second homes. You say in Para 78, and I quote, additional income arising from council tax reforms to banding multipliers, so those are the statutory reforms uh, for the top uh, three, or I can't remember, four bands, are also shown. But you're going to say councils do not benefit from these increases as the Scottish Government funding mechanism has been adjusted accordingly. So if I can just put to you... Um, uh, uh, fig figures here. Let, let's just assume for the sake of argument that the general revenue grant is £100 and the increase arising as a consequence of the banding is, is, is £10. Are you therefore saying that were the banding not to have changed, the general revenue grant would be 110 In other words, there's no net impact on the receipts to local government of the banding change. I just want some clarity around that, because obviously this issue is partly related to a bigger question about transparency of figures and numbers, which we talked about last year. OK, well, we're not saying that, but Tim can explain better than I can <laughs> what we actually are saying. Uh, I think we, we're talking about individual council level. There's an equalisation there. So uh, what we're trying to say in relation to the Exhibit 19 is that those councils at the high incidence of the higher banded properties don't benefit from that, it's equalised through the mechanism. But I don't think we're saying that uh, the overall uh, level of um, uh, settlement has been reduced equally, uh, if, if that makes sense. So we're talking more about individual council level, I guess. Okay, so what basically saying is, when you say councils do not benefit from these increases, as the Scottish Government funding mechanism has been adjusted accordingly, what, what you really mean is that they don't necessarily benefit on an individual council basis yes, for exactly. all of the increase. So yeah. for the sake of argument, if, and it's probably correct, the City of Edinburgh has the highest yield from those top bands, it doesn't get all the additional revenue. And the equalisation means that some of that flows to other councils. Yes, exactly. OK, so that's extremely... That's a very helpful question, Mr Wayne, because as it happens, we were, we were talking about this paragraph just this morning before we came in, and I think what might be helpful, Convener, is if we can to write to the committee just to clarify that, because I think what we would recognise is that the way number 68 is 
uh, paragraph 68 is worded could be a little bit clearer on that specific point. So we're happy to, for the record, to, to write to the committee and just to clarify that. But what you've just described is, is the situation, Mr Whiteman. Yeah. That's grand. Just very briefly, if, um, if it's possible to create a beautiful graph like you do in Exhibit 19 to illustrate that redistribution, um, that would be helpful. If not, it doesn't actually matter. Okay. Thanks. Clarify something because I thought I understood it until Mr. Whiteman started asking his questions, and now I'm not sure if I understand it. Uh, so it says additional income from council tax banding reform, £110 million. That is real money that exists. Right, so and how that goes to councils and how much each council gets, that's the discussion we're having around here. But councils are getting £110 million because of this. £110 million, pounds, well. The added complexity is we don't know exactly how much it will be, of course, because that depends on collection and everything sure. else at the end of the year. But let's work with that figure for the moment, because that's what's anticipated. So that is new money in the system at the top line. So the point we're trying to make here, is, as, as we've just been talking about, is how that then works through into individual councils. So yeah. yeah, everything else muddies the waters. It's new money. And then we'll be interested to see the details of how that money... That's very helpful. Uh, and with councils, increasing their council tax by up to 3%, that's £53 million new money as well, is that correct? Uh, yes. Right. So the, that Exhibit 19, the, the light blue bar are, represents what represents the decisions that those councils have made um, on their council tax, and that equates to about £53 million. Yeah. So we can, we, can, we can look at the proportion of overall spend, but in theory, roughly £163 million new money because of council tax reforms going to local government. That's what that shows. Um, the question I actually wanted to ask was a, was a really short one, but I, I just wanted clarity in that because of the questions Mr Whiteman was asking, um, and that is, the councils that decided to raise the council tax, were they in any more financial distress than the ones who decided not to raise their council tax? Were they any less likely to manage their finances well than the ones that did not raise their council tax? Because if we're looking at the ability and the policy decision to raise council tax. What I'm trying to gather is whether the reason for raising or not raising council tax, was it to do with the financial management, good, bad or indifferent or otherwise? Was there a correlation there? Did you look to see if there was a correlation there? Uh, no, we didn't. Um, and that's because the, the, the question, the, the other part of the correlation there is something very difficult to exercise a judgment on. And um, we do, obviously, in, 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 in auditing individual councils, made judgments, as I said earlier, about the financial stewardship and so on, but there's a slightly more qualitative element to the judgment about how well or badly they manage their finances, and it's a very complex um, judgment to make. So I don't think we would be um, able to make the correlation or demonstrate that it doesn't exist. Um, and in any event, as you'll know, and the reasons why councils will choose to raise council tax or not raise it are many and wonderful, and some of them have to do with service pressures, but they have to do with other things as well, including some political considerations. So I wouldn't expect prima facie I to see a correlation between how well or badly a council was managed. We would tend to look at it the other way and um, make a starting assumption, perhaps, which is that if you didn't have to raise your council tax, um, then all other things being equal, um, the pressure on your budget shouldn't have been so acute, because otherwise you would have taken the option of raising the council tax. So I wouldn't expect to see that the councils in most difficulty were the very ones who chose not to raise their council tax, but we haven't made that correlation to find out. Okay, that's helpful. Fi final question. I'll move to Mr Gibson in a second. Um, just in terms of trying to find out if there's a consistency of reason why council tax was or wasn't increased and it was in relation to financial distress, and it's hard to take the kind of polit politics and political choices out of that, but I wanted to know if you've been able to do that. Clearly, you can. A uh, key message for you see councils' expenditure and use of reserves often differed noticeably from what, what was originally planned, indicating need for better budget setting to become more robust and reliable. Now, does that mean that where there was that big differentiation, they just got their numbers wrong, or had local authorities made in in your policy? changes and choices that weren't factored into the initial budget set because actually there wouldn't be any need if, if councils had decided a, a suite of closures of, of some facility or a restructuring of another organisation and the political climate was such locally they said let's not do that they don't accrue the savings that would show that different that di differential from the original budget set so what I'm trying to tease out is whether this was councils 
changing halfway through a financial year what its policy intent was or whether it was local authorities just doing poor planning to begin with? It's an excellent question, convener, and, and I don't think we have the exact answer for it because, again, it varies enormously, but you're absolutely right to highlight and it's, uh, the details in Exhibit 9 on page 22. It is very striking that the vast majority of councils don't use the reserves as planned. Some use more, some use less, uh, and we think that is an issue. So, so in some cases, we think it's about the budgets that, set, that, that is set at the start of the year. Uh, we had one uh, report at the Commission recently where uh, a council routinely underspent its budget, has done for the last five years or so, and so had uh, increased its reserves in an unplanned way year on year. Now, you could argue, they might argue that that's prudent. Our view is, well, it would have been prudent if that's what, if that's what your plans had said. There will be occasions where um, something has happened in year that has affected that, um, but equally as likely it is that um, either their budget setting isn't robust enough or that their financial monitoring isn't robust enough through the year. So it's, so it's a long way round, convener, of saying it's difficult to tell, but all the, all the things that you've just described will be in the mix there. Yeah, um, I, I had looked at Exhibit 9, but um, I got a bit of brain freeze looking at it, uh, Mr McKinley, to be honest. So that, that was one of the reasons for asking the question. But OK, so it's all of those things and none of the above at the same time. So it's a real mixed picture. It's, it's, it's really hard to tease that out. You would never do a breakdown per for each local authority to say uh, the, the, the variation from original plans was mainly because of policy changes or mainly because of weakness in initial numbers? So, so, where, so where we'd report on that is that the Commission has asked me to report to the Accounts Commission on all councils in terms of their duty of best value over the next five-year period. So when we get into those more in-depth best value reviews of each individual council, that's where we'd get to a more qualitative assessment of exactly what's going on in there, so, um, so that you know, it's quite a big bit of work to really get under the skin of why, why it is as it is, and it would be those kind of best value reviews that we would, um, we would get under the skin of some of that. The All right. is a good one, though. I'll add to that by saying we, we comment in the report on the uh, deficiency in some cases of the management commentaries that councils are obliged to make under the public reporting duties, and that in the first instance is where I would expect to see the kind of detail that you're asking about. So the primary responsibility to give a clear and coherent account of why things have panned out the way they have as opposed to the way they were planned lies with councils and they have a duty to do that. And we criticise uh, councils in the report for not paying sufficient attention to that. So we will continue to exercise sinew over that and try to get councils to report that better in the first instance. And we may have an interest, as Fraser is saying, looking at the best value aspect of this to see what that tells us and how we can therefore try to interpret and explain it. But the information has to come from the councils. They're the ones who will be making the decisions as the year pans out. Thank you. Uh, Kenneth Gibson. Yeah, thanks very much. Give me a good morning, uh, panel. Uh, an excellent, fascinating report, uh, as always. Um, I'd like to take you to Exhibit 21. Um, where uh, we have uh, budget use and remaining levels of general fund reserves. And it's quite interesting. We touched on this last year, uh, the, the huge variance in terms of reserve levels across local authorities. We see, for example, um, in Berkeley with about 26% of its income. We see Dundee with about 3%. But what you've said um, in, under the uh, Exhibit 21 is that councils uh, using more general fund reserves relative to the amount remaining face greater challenges. And you've specifically pointed to three local authorities, Murray, Clark Manninshire and North Ayrshire. I am an MSP in North Ayrshire. And you've said basically that using general fund reserves at the current rate is not an option for some councils. Uh, uh, Manager Murray and North Ayrshire will, would run out of general fund reserves within two or three years if they continue to use them at the level plan for 2017-18. Now, if, assuming that the, the Scottish Government uh, distribute um, uh, resources to local government according to the current formula. Well, that, what will that mean effectively, given you know these constraints for these local authorities in terms of their ability to deliver services relative to other local authorities? You mean the ones, ones who are closest, if you three, like, to, yeah. to, to running out of reserves, given they can't dip in anymore. Okay. Well, the, I think the first thing that I would say about that is that. Um, Clearly, uh, in the situation of those councils, I would expect them to be setting budgets for the next year and the years ahead, reflecting the fact that they've got less, if you like, buffer room um, in those reserves. And so they may well budget to replenish their reserves for all I know. 
Um, so that might be one possibility. It's not a static situation, really, is what I'm saying. Um, so while we make a comment like what would happen if uh, they continue to run down their reserves at that rate, it's not because we expect that that is what will happen. We recognise other circumstances will come into play. The second point is that, and this has already been touched on in the discussion, what actually happens in the course of the financial year won't be, in every instance, what has been planned. Um, so those councils, for example, um, may plan to restore their balances and find that their financial situation is somewhat better than they'd expected. They're able to make savings at a faster rate than they'd anticipated, so they might therefore be able to further restore those balances. We simply don't know. So the only point we can make with safety here is that if nothing else changes, they might find themselves hitting a difficult position sooner than, than some others. And I think more than that is really difficult to, to talk about. I wouldn't be taking the view um, that because they are getting close to the level where their reserves um, are near some kind of a deemed minimum, that they're necessarily going to run out of reserves in two or three years. I think those are choices that they can make. Yes, but the other point I was making was what would the impact be on service if they are, services if they are to ensure that they do continue to have reserves and they do some more uh, rebalancing? Is that, uh, you know... Um, you know, they're going to have to, um, you know, reduce service provision in those areas, say, deeper than, than other local authorities might? Well, potentially, that's one case. Again, we haven't looked at the circumstances of each of the councils that you've referred to in any detail there, so I'll extrapolate from this, the specific and make a general point. Again, all other things being equal, if a council has taken longer to come to some of the harder decisions that some other councils may already have made, then that means that those hard decisions still lie ahead of them, unless the financial situation overall changes for the better. And there's no indication that we can see that that will happen. So it may well be that difficult decisions about services in some of those councils um, will still have to be made. And they could be compounded by the possibility they may feel that they have to increase their reserves to give themselves that greater degree of security for the longer term. But all those are hypothetical comments. I simply don't know until we look at the individual circumstances. The level of reserves that a council holds will be a function of a number of factors. Um, there are some councils that we would regard as, as relatively well run who don't have very high levels of reserves, but they're very comfortable in that situation because they have confidence in their ability to manage their budgets. So that's another factor. Uh, switching to, to paragraph uh, um, uh, 28, uh, which you've, you've said that councils delegated 2.4 billion of social care expenditure uh, to integrated joint board budgets for 2016-17, and NHS boards contributed 5.6 billion. But you then talk about the establishment and development of uh, IGBs has been a complex exercise. It'll take time to mature. Um, uh, their operation will be focus of further performance audit work we've planned in 2018. I mean, how can the work of these integrated joint boards be made more transparent? You know, given the, the huge amounts of money we're actually talking about. Um, so we, as it says there, Mr. Gibson, we are on behalf of the Commission and the Auditor General doing our second report on integration um, uh, next year, probably publishing about this time next year. We did one uh, just at the outset of IGBs and we're doing a second one really to monitor progress. But there's no doubt that it's taken them the last couple of years really to get, if you like, the, the basic governance arrangements in place. So things like how the board operates. Um, budgeting continues to be challenging. There are differences in terms of the uh, the timing of budget cycles in NHS and councils, which makes it difficult. Um, so, so we are very clear that um, the IGBs need to progress uh, with those kind of, if you like, nuts and bolts of how they're operating, so that they can really begin to focus on integrating services on the ground, which, after all, is what is what the integration exercise is all about to improve outcomes for for local communities. So so we are um, doing an update report on that over the next 12 months or so, and we'll be uh, in a position to, to say more about progress and exactly the kinds of things that need to happen in future. But but I think my sense at the moment is they're still struggling to get beyond some of those things about how these new organisations work um, um, and not enough time and energy and focus yet going into actually integrating the services on the ground. Thank you. Just one further point, Convener, if that's okay. In, in terms of, um, at the end of paragraph 22, the heading before 23, you say councils have been seeking to maximise the income available to them for uh, from charging for services, but uh, 
that doesn't seem an actual fact to be the case. My understanding from the space support that we've been given here on local government finance fees and charges 2011 to 2015-16, in actual fact is that there's been a 4.5% reduction in charges from 569.7 million to 5 for 4.2 million and what's interesting about this report they go through all the local authorities and it's quite for some it seems to be a bit of a roller coaster you know like charges seem to go up and down and round about for year to year i mean i mean west Lothian, for example in the last year increased charges from more than 4 million to about 11 million but falkirk five years in a row has increased them every year and Perth and Ross uh, from 17 to 20 million in real terms whereas Perth and Ross has steadily reduced them from 14 to seven, less than seven million pounds over the same time period. So, uh, what is actually going on there? <laughs> <laughs> to take that one. Um, that that uh, report, as I understand it, is an analysis of um, information that's submitted to the Scottish Government. Uh, it's not subject to audit. Uh, it's the first thing I would say. Um, and. Actually, we, we've not got a full picture because that's submitted by councils, and quite often councils uh, provide services through arm's length bodies, uh, leisure services trusts and care trusts and the like. So I think some of those uh, ups and downs, if you like, are, are, are maybe just because um, there's a new alio uh, and that income is no longer shown on the council's uh, um, return to Scottish Government. I think there's also a little bit of uh, data quality issue around uh, uh, transfers between councils featuring as income in some cases, which is, is clearly not, not what we, we want to analyse in terms of uh, uh, charges to service users. So um, I know the Scottish Government are looking to address that and clean up the data for 1617, which will be available in the new year. Um, so it'll be interesting to see in terms of the, the, the movement. The comment we make is really off the back of um, what we see in budget setting reports. And we do see that councils are you know, looking to, to, to maximise their income. That's not to say they would necessarily increase their fees and charges by more than inflation, but you know, ordinarily, uh, you know, they would be increasing their fees and charges. Uh, there's an exhibit towards the back of the report where we look at um, some of the budget initiatives for 17, 18, and there's some examples in there, the sorts of things that they're doing um, to in increase charges and introduce new charges in some cases. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, for example, what just, just um, arts and culture, for example, um, uh, income from fees and charges across Scotland have fallen from 42.6 million to 30.5 million and it does actually say that 10 councils did not consistently report income in every year, suggesting that while they'll be recording this income within different categories of where income has not been recorded, new arrangements may have been introduced and there is an element about alios. But you see North Ayrshire, uh, for example, Aber uh, Aberdeen, uh, Angus, you know, more than 80% of the budget is received in charges and yet you've got other local authorities, uh, for example, you know, East Renfrewshire where it's zero contribution uh, fees and charges towards arts and culture budget. So uh, taking into account things like alios, is, is there any, you know, it, it just seems to me from this report that there is significant inconsistencies and I don't really see any great evidence that local authorities are, as, as you say, maximising income available to charging for services, particularly at this challenging time. <coughs> In a sense, um, Mr Gibson, the reason that we've worked with SPICE to produce this report, which I think is enormously helpful, is, is we recognise the need to better answer your question, which is what's going on here, because it has been it was, a, it was a subject that came up uh, last year when we were with you, and that's why we've progressed this piece of work. And I think what the SPICE briefing does is ask lots more questions about um, the consistency question, about how individual councils go about it. I think the point we make in our report about seeking to maximise, as Tim says, is a more recent thing we've seen in the last, in the last budget setting. So you're absolutely right to say that the trend... Um, over the time period from 11, 12 and onwards has been coming down. I think what we're beginning to see, given budget pressures in other areas, is councils beginning to look to, to increase that again. So that will be something that we'll want to track carefully as we head into the future. But the basic point is we need to better understand what's going on here. The Commission did a report a couple of years back which set out some principles about how to go about setting fees and charges and the kinds of things that we would expect to see to make sure that it's not a kind of finger in the air exercise that it's actually planned and, and in line with priorities and those kinds of things. So this is an area that we want to keep a close eye on and, and the SPICE briefing is a really good uh, starting point for that. Thank you. Thanks, Kadir. Okay. 
Only if it's specifically on this, Mr. Whiteman, because I've got Alexander Shute and Jane Ruth waiting to come in specifically on this. It is. Okay. It is indeed. It's a very brief follow-up on the fees and charges on this question. I mean, the fact that Spice notes that the income is falling, do you have any sense on whether that's because they're charging less or because a lot of people are choosing not to use the services because they can't afford them anymore? I don't think we're in a position to, to say that. I think I think that's the kind of analysis that we might want to get into in the future, Mr. Whiteman, but at the moment, at least we've got a better picture of the of the current situation. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr Gibson. Yes, uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Many councils see themselves in a financial crisis in some respects, and your report indicates and gives us highlights of, 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 of councils that find themselves in a more difficult situation. But each council has a, a short, a medium and long-term financial plan, uh, and Audit Scotland look at that in, in, on the round and tell them if they've got stronger or not strong financial planning and financial management within that council. But going forward, uh, many councils deal with their borrowing strategy to try and manage some situations too. I'd like to ask you some, some uh, reference to that. You know, at the moment, we have quite low interest rates, uh, and many councils use that uh, to, to ensure that that gives them uh, some kind of buffer when they're borrowing. As we go forward, that's going to potentially change, uh, and that buffer is going to be removed, uh, along with others, uh, uh, as you've indicated, if, if the reserve strategy isn't being managed effectively. So, so can I ask you to just explain what your view would be on that? Uh, if, if the reserve strategy is, is, is not going to progress, and if the borrowing strategy is not going to progress, then where do we really find uh, ourselves and local government with this process? Uh, OK, well, across the board, I would probably dispute that um, we're looking at reserves or borrowing strategy not progressing or not working. Um, the point we make um, for the 32 councils as a whole is that it continues to be the case that there's a significant amount of money held in reserves, not by all of them, but across the piece. Um, so that continues to represent some kind of um, buffer, as you put it, against the vagaries of what um, funding and other matters might hold for them. Comparably with the borrowing, although um, there has been a move recently with interest rates going up, um, it's anybody's guess, and mine is no better than anyone else's, what that might mean in the longer term and whether that turns out to be a step in a, uh, on a journey or um, just a one-off um, and something that could be reversed. So we don't know. But what we do know is that councils... Um, have, by and large, pretty good treasury management strategies, including the amount that they borrow. Um, you can see in the report uh, the extent to which they make use of the various devices at their disposal, not to be exposed unduly to fluctuations in things like interest rates. So while it might be the case for you or I, if we're sitting with a mortgage at an increase of half a percent or whatever, turns out to be a real impact on your pocket the day after tomorrow, that won't necessarily be the case for well-managed councils because they've got fixed interest rates that they're put in place. They also have other strings to their bow. They can decide when to borrow. Um, so if their crystal ball is a little clearer than mine, they might think they do have a better idea and they'll get good advice on this about what might happen to interest rates in, say, 12 months' time. So they could decide to borrow now against a possible rise and therefore have a further cushion. Our view of that would always be a holistic one. We would always look at how well they manage their finances in that particular context across the piece rather than how exposed they might be to one-off changes in interest rates and so on. So we don't have overwhelming concerns about that. What we do say in the report is clearly there's been a significant shift in the year that we've just audited in the overall amount of debt that local government has. Uh, and the key even to that is, what does that mean in terms of affordability? And we say um, that, broadly speaking, it's something like 10% of general fund uh, income or expenditure, rather, that's committed to the repayment of those debts and the interest that goes with it. I think, but Tim can keep me right, um, although that 10% is clearly not an insubstantial figure, it's actually a reduction um, on the figure the year before. Um, so these things do move around a little bit, and just because there have been an increase in interest rates in the last few months doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see local government budgets next year having 12 or 13 or 14% uh, committed to this. But it's a long-term issue that we have to keep a long-term eye on. And we do work with councils to make sure that they have good strategies behind what they do. So I wouldn't be concerned in terms of the spirit of the question that the trends in borrowing that we report here for last year or the movements in reserves necessarily expose them in a more perilous way than previously. So, so in, in reality, they, they, they may find themselves less exposed 
uh, in, in that in that context uh, because they have they have that strong financial management process that they can tap into uh, and that gives them an advantage uh, uh, against other organizations out in the in the, in the field uh, but but when when we're thinking of of how how that is interpreted going forward uh, and how every local council can then plan uh, to, to manage its finances over the next three to five years. That becomes a very important process for them. Uh, and, and within the report, as I say, you've identified uh, councils that, that maybe don't have uh, a strong uh, a view of doing that and a strong uh, a process to ensure that they don't find themselves uh, uh, at the end of, that, at the, end of the, the day in a, in a more perilous situation. Uh, but, but I think you know, the, the, the idea of trying to, to coordinate and manage that financial is important. But my, my next question would be that in, in the long-term situation that they find themselves looking to uh, uh, and with the, the new difficulties uh, with the <laughs> demographics they have and IGBs and all of that coming into the mix, uh, the, the, the way that they're spending their money is changing uh, depending, on their, depending on what they're trying to manage within that process. And, and they don't have the flexibility on some of that because it is statutory and because it is uh, left to them. And they must spend the money on that before they can then deal with other things which they may have to reduce or they may have to increase charges on. But, but what, do you, what is your view and feeling of that going forward uh, for many of the councils? So if, if what you're referring to is the, the comment in the report about the differential impact Between. of the savings that have had to be made yes. um, across the range of services that councils provide, um, then we do feel that's an increasingly important point. Uh, and that's why we've made it again in this report. And we'll make it again in a different fashion. We will look at the services themselves in the overview report in the early part of the new year. Um, so clearly is the case, and it's not just because of statutory protection, there's other degrees of, if you like, preference or priority attached for perfectly understandable and justifiable reasons to some services compared to others. Our view about that is, um, while that is perfectly um, justifiable and it's up to councils um, to set their own priorities, sometimes in conjunction with the Scottish Government, that has to be done with your eyes wide open. You have to be very conscious of the impact that that therefore has on other services. Now, we try to set that out here in financial terms. We're not saying um, that the, I think, 12% reduction that we looked at over a three-year period in culture and leisure services is unsustainable. That's not our view. Our view is that it's quite clearly different to the level of savings that have had to be made for, say, the education service. So while councils are entitled to say we want to protect education and the Scottish Government is entitled to come to understandings with them on that, the consequences of that for the other services have to be noted. And we think it's a part of the council's best value duty to make sure that they are doing that. Um, so we're pushing very hard to make sure that the impact that that has on those services is something that councils understand. We'll say more about that in the report that we published in the new year. It needs to be quite brief because other members want to know. Mr. It's just on the debt issue. I mean, you talked about you know local authorities actually able, they've been able to you know be able to manage debt etc by borrowing when interest rates are low etc. But, but at the bottom of paragraph 53, you also say uh, PPP, PFI, and index-linked bonds include charges that increase with inflation. So surely. That means that the local authorities, again, such as North Ayrshire, which do have high uh, payments in terms of PFI, are more exposed. All other things being equal, Han, I think I would have to uh, agree with that. And we are going to do so. I'll ask Fraser to say more about this in a moment. But we are going to do a bespoke piece of work um, on these various forms of funding for capital projects, including PFI and PPP in the new year. Um, not, not just driven by this, but you're right. The reality is that um, there's a degree of... Um, uh, lack of flexibility, if you like, around some of those that may not apply to other aspects of even capital funding. Um, so we have to make sure that that's being looked at in the context of the bigger picture that we're trying to paint here, which is how much of your budget is given over one way or another to maintaining the costs of capital investment decisions that you've made in the past. And that's not because we think those decisions have been badly made, but because the context in which some of those earlier decisions may have been made, the overall financial context, would be very different to the context now. And of course, as room for manoeuvre one way or another is decreased, then the impact of that is greater on the council budgets. But Fraser might want to say a wee bit more about the piece of work we intend to do in that particular area. It, so, so not much convenient other than to say that we, we do have on uh, the plan uh, to look at not just PPP, PFI, but the whole kind of alternative means of financing and funding uh, capital projects. And we'll get into some of those issues 
issues there. I think the only other point I would make is it comes back to the same central point, which is the importance of good, medium and long-term financial planning. So, so the council should absolutely be aware of the exposure they have, and um, what they, we would expect them to be uh, to be doing good sensitivity analysis that would understand what would happen if an interest rate rose or or didn't, and indeed, as many councils do, look to quite actively manage and reprofile their debt. Um, as, as they go. So um, all of those things is why we, we keep banging the drum for, for better, medium and longer term financial planning. Thank you. Thanks, Kabir. Jenny Goruth. Good morning to the panel. Um, I have a specific question with regard to paragraph 20, which is about universal credit. Um, and as you say, it has been rolled out across, I think, five different council areas in Scotland. And you see here that rent arrears across these councils increased in 2016-17 by an average of 14%, compared with an average of only 4% across the remaining councils. And within your own housing benefit performance audit report, you highlight that councils are finding that the rollout of universal credit is having a detrimental effect on their collection of housing rental income. So I just want to ask, then, is universal credit specifically creating a uh, increased financial pressure on local councils? Um, it's, it's, uh, I think that's, that, that's fair to say for housing authorities, um, and there are pressures on rents within the HRA. So uh, I, I, we normally try and dis differentiate between general fund, general services, which are funded via um, general revenue grant and taxation, uh, and the housing revenue accounts, which are funded via rents. But I think it's fair to say that the, the, the pressures so far have been largely housing revenue account pressures for those councils, um, rent collection type issues. Uh, there's, there's some there's some sense that there, there, there may there may be potentially be some general fund pressures associated with universal credit, but it's uh, it's a bit early for, for for me to be able to comment on that. The only thing I would add to that is obviously in a report like this, we touch on a number of issues that we can't really develop, and this is one of them. Um, but it would be remiss not to make any mention of this, just because the primary focus of this work happens to be the council general fund. But again, um, we are. Um, planning a specific piece of work on housing. We did the report on housing maybe three years ago, I think, uh, and we feel with a number of situations, and this is one of them, um, it's time for another look then. I would expect that that would be the opportunity to get into the depth of this, and by then we'll know more. At the moment we know what we can report here, which is not much, um, but we'll be beyond the pilot stage, I presume, with a number of councils by the time we produce that report, and we'll be able to look in greater depth at what impact, if any, it's having. Um, on rent arrears. At the moment, we can simply see a pattern of correlation emerging there. Um, but we need to get under the skin of that and find out what is actually happening and whether it's something that's sustainable or maybe just a blip because of the difficulty in introducing quite a new system of benefits. We don't know at this stage. Um, you may, again, not know the answer to this next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, the report itself talks about risk and uncertainty. Um, a number of groups in my own constituency in Fife who have been supported directly by EU structural funds. So that those projects are uh, often administered via the council. I know five council work closely with them. So I'd like to ask then if you have a view on how, re how Brexit is going to impact upon local government finance. <laughs> yeah, just an easy one there. <laughs> well, I'm very tempted just to pull up the drawbridge and say we don't, we don't cover that in this report. And <laughs> I can't comment on that. Um, Again, what I can say, um, with a degree of uh, security, I think, is that as the picture becomes clearer, we've already identified Brexit, as you'd be, you'd be surprised if I said anything other than this, as one of the bigger landscape risks that we have to operate within. Um, so our view is clearly local government. Brexit pervades um, the economy as a whole and other factors too. But as we do our risk planning going forward and come to decisions about which pieces of work we might most usefully do, and I've referred to a couple of them already, then Brexit is one of the risks that's already in our planning and obviously getting, getting bigger at the moment. So I guess the best thing that I could say is when it becomes a little clearer what it might mean in terms of EU funding as it impacts local communities and via councils in particular, um, the sharper our thinking will be about whether a particular piece of work around that might be useful. At the moment, I think it would be too speculative for us to do anything that would add value. Sorry, can I very briefly add to that that um, we've this year, uh, as we begin planning for the coming audit year, which kicks off kind of about now, we've asked auditors specifically to do some work to look at how um, the bodies that we audit, and that's across the public sector, so on behalf of the Commission and the Auditor General, how the bodies we audit are preparing for Brexit. So, so we're doing some work to to check the extent to which individual public bodies are themselves. 
um, understanding the impact um, of it. My sense in councils is that they are really quite alert to it, that they understand um, the money that, that comes via Europe, and of course they'll be doing what they can to prepare for that. As we know, the challenge with this particular topic is there's so much uncertainty, it's very difficult to actually plan in any detail, but, but I think um, our sense is that they are alert to it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so last last year when we were looking at this, there was um, uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a very clear picture um, whether council funding was going down or up or or, or the same, and it, you know, it was all very confused. And we made uh, reference to this uh, in in our report. Uh, I think one of the factors uh, around that was uh, integrated joint boards. Um, are, we, are, are we any sort of clearer now? Uh, I notice in your report, uh, paragraph 11, uh, and you seem to include uh, money um, from integrated joint boards, and you, you do say there's a, a revenue uh, cut um, in 2016-17 of 5.2% in, in real terms. Um, we, we struggled last year to get to a... A definitive figure. Are, are you any clearer on things this year? Uh, well, I'm looking for the, the reference. There's a table somewhere that demonstrates the movements. It's page 11. Uh, it's that one. So, uh, are you asking about the the movements over time in the funding for local government? Is that the point of the question? Am I misunderstanding it? No. La last year, we, yeah, you know, when we were looking at the the, the whole budget issue. We, I think it's fair to say we, we struggled to get to a, a, an actual figure. Whether, was money to councils going down or not? Um, no. One of the confusing bits around that was the I, IJBs. Uh, there, there were other factors. But yeah, I, I'm just merely asking you, do you think we're any closer to getting clarity? Well, I hope so, and I think part of that might be um, the result of the um, decisions that you came to on the consideration of our report, as well as evidence from other, other sources, and I've seen the correspondence around that and some of the uh, undertakings that have been given by the, the government on this, so we await with interest what that will actually mean when the, uh, the budget figures are produced in a few weeks' time. In relation to the specific point about IGBs, what we've done here, which I hope is helpful, is try to separate out the effect of the additional resource given to IJBs in 2016-17, and later we do it for 17-18 as well. Um, so we stand by what we said at the time about whether it's right or otherwise to include IJB funding in an account of um, what's happening in terms of Scottish Government funding as a whole to local government. Uh, which is that the money to the IGBs goes into the accounts of the health boards, and as a consequence, we don't think that that should be included in that total. But um, we recognise that different people can take a different view about that, and what we're trying to do here is just to separate it out so that you can see for yourself. And it's a matter of choice, really, which line in that particular analysis you think is the right one to, to look at. And that is as clear as we can be on it. It's clearly money that goes into the accounts of the health board. What happens to after that is part of the bigger picture we touched on earlier to do with IGBs and we'll be interested amongst other things in clarity about whether all of that money finds its way into the budgets of the IGBs um, but at the moment all we can say is that that money uh, is something that doesn't go to local government and therefore in our view um, wouldn't be part of local government funding from the Scottish Government. Okay, so when, when we're looking at it, do you think we should be discounting the IJB money that goes to health boards and just looking at the money that goes direct to councils? It depends what point you're trying to make. I think we're trying to make a comparison over a period of years and say what is the position to for local government's funding from the Scottish government compared to the Scottish government's own funding. So if you're trying to make that kind of comparison, you use the statistics one way. If you're trying to make another point, you use the statistics another way. And it depends what point you're trying to make, really. Well, I'm, I'm not trying to make a point. Um, I think the point last year is we we just needed to know the position. Um, and uh, I mean, you've illustrated the problem. So from, a, from my point, Camilla, I think we get we get to a point where I think it's always going to be difficult to get everyone to sign up to a single figure that that can answer the question: Is it going up or down, or not? 
um, which is why we've tried to separate it out in the way that we have this time round. Um, and, uh, and as the, the, the Deputy Chair said earlier, this is the second time we've done this report. I'm sure there's more we, we'll be able to do next year to bring even more clarity and transparency. And, and our experience of, of doing this kinds of thing on things like um, uh, reserves, for example, when the Commission started reporting on reserves now some years ago, that shone a spotlight on an area of local government finance that was very opaque. And now the fact that we're able to have a conversation about what's happening in reserves in individual councils is a sign, I think, of, of how the debate can move on a bit. And I would anticipate um, this being similar. It, we, as the Deputy Chair said, we'll watch with interest in a couple of weeks' time um, how the Cabinet Secretary presents this. I think what we're trying to do is, rather than come up with a single figure, is be as clear as we can as to the different elements of that figure, Mr Simpson. And then, as you say, beyond that, people will, will make their own judgments. Okay. Okay, um, I might just follow up on a couple of bits of that, because that's obviously Elena, a question I've been pursuing for, for some time as well. You, you made the point, Mr Hines, I suppose it's what point you're trying to make. From my point, it's a bit the kind of question that I would want to ask. So if the question I wanted to ask is, can we focus on what's happened specifically to the revenue grant of Scottish Government to local authorities over years? That gives you one set of statistics. Or you could ask the question, because we're doing budget scrutiny as part of this evidence session as well, uh, what additional revenues from Scottish Government, be it direct or indirect, goes to local authorities to support the delivery of services, which is why I think it's very helpful that Exhibit 2 shows the quite significant difference you get in the numbers if you do include IGB funds. Um, in terms of the spending power or in terms of the liability that local authorities have anyway, would you not recognise that you would have to include IGB funds, given the fact I understand 125 million of those funds in the last year was for living wage, wage pressures within the, the social care sector, and had those monies not came through the NHS, that money would have to be found from elsewhere? I'll rephrase it. It, it's, it depends on your interest in the subject, I think. So the way you've put it, I think, is very helpful. Um, if your interest is to see how much purchasing or spending power there is out there to provide a range of local services, then in terms of Exhibit 2, for example, I think your eye would be drawn to the bottom line that says, well, the £250 million, in this case for 16-17 that went into IGBs, is clearly meant to be buying local health and care services. So that would draw you to that conclusion. If your interest is something different about which particular bits of the funding formula for, the local, for local government are properly attributable to local government, i.e. to councils as entities, then you'd be looking at something different. So it's not the point you're trying to make its interest that you have in the matter. Can I ask then, the, the, the money that comes through the, 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 the general revenue grants, does that include the, and I forget the number now, uh, the £110 million pounds that would come from the the change into the council tax bandings, the multipliers on that, would that be would that be included within that? No, no, no that, that's very much local income that councils collect. Right. The, the reason I'm asking that is because and Mr. Whiteman set the scene very well at the opening of this evidence session, and that was if we're having a debate when we do budget scrutiny over the spending power of local authorities and the flexibility of local authorities in which to raise revenue. There's been a belief over the years that they've become far too reliant on the revenue grant from Scottish Government. So as other levers of revenue become available to local authorities, I would find it helpful for that to be set aside in the same table. So I would have found it helpful for Exhibit 2 to also have included uh, those monies in terms of the council tax multipliers that go to local authorities because that was a Scottish Government decision made and it's money, so they, it's the real money they get. I would have found it helpful to have the projected 3% council tax increase as well to get the actual position of local <coughs> government. My frustration is we had this with Cosler the other week. I totally accept it's the, the Scottish Government's job. What is, the Scottish Government does each year try to make the financial position of councils look as good as they possibly can and Cosler tries to make it look as weak as it possibly can. And there, in, bet in between, lies the truth somewhere down the line. So I, I wonder, we will await with interest the information we get from Mr Mackay when the budget's produced. We've been pretty clear what this committee expects from Mr Mackay. But whether that does or doesn't appear, we'll have to wait and see. I wonder if, if, if you would consider 
in, in, in future revisions of this report to include these other monies as part of something like Exhibit 2 to give us a better feel for, for the actual position of local government? Uh, well, what we do in the report is show elsewhere, and you've obviously identified it, um, the, the figure, the £110 million that you're referring to in this instance, <coughs> Uh, in a different context, so we're not disputing for a second that that is additional resource that local government has at its disposal. The question I think that's being posed now is whether, it's, whether it sits properly within the analysis on the, uh, the page that we're looking at underneath Exhibit 1 and Exhibit 2. Um, so we can take the point on board, but what I'd undertake to do now is, I said at the beginning, we're happy to provide further information to the committee as a result of discussion this morning, if you think it would be helpful. So we're more than happy to put these pieces of the jigsaw together, if you like, in a response to you and set out as best we can where we think these relative sums of money sit. But I will say, um, even in advance of doing that, what I said before is it depends what interest you have in the matter. This part is looking at something called Scottish Government Revenue Funding to Councils. Now, it would be a, a significant interpretation of that to say that council tax, even a part of it, was Scottish Government revenue funding to councils. It might be funding that councils have at their disposal, but I don't think it would sit happily under that heading. So we need to think about how best to present that in a way that was clear and helpful. I think that's the point very well made. I, I fully accept. I also accept I don't think it's the responsibility of yourselves to do that. I think it's the responsibility of the Scottish Government to set up their figures clearly and for that to be scrutinised by yourselves and by other, us and others. So uh, uh, it would, we, whilst we'd have found it helpful, I don't think the, 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 the onus sits with your organisation. Um, uh, maybe we're Exhibit 23. I had a couple of brief questions to, to better understand Exhibit 23, then we'll move to my deputy convener for further questions. Um, I just wanted to understand, <laughs> and looking at it again now, I thought I understood it until off on a tangent there, Mr Hines. Let, let me look at it again. So, in terms of potential funding gaps for local authorities in the coming financial year, because we'll find out what that settlement is very shortly, um, the figure of a potential funding shortfall of £343 million, again, is that looking at the overall monies going to local authorities or just the revenue grant? That, that, that's um, basically just based on their overall uh, income from general revenue grant and taxation, so it includes council tax. Does it include um, a, 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 a integrated, integrated joint board funds? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, Is one cause like a, no? I don't. I don't think that. Uh, I don't think that does. I think that's just basically the. Uh, that, that doesn't feature at that level. That, I think that comes into their accounts at a higher level. This is their sort of what we'd call their, their net revenue expenditure to be funded from general revenue grant and taxation. So the, the IGP uh -huh. money would come in at a higher level. So I think what would be helpful is when it says, in, in the absence of further savings, councils would use around £343 million in 1819 if expenditure were to increase by 0.5% in terms of expenditure and income decrease by 1.5%, is whether or not that funding gap assumes that £250 million has been already given to local authorities via IGBs or whether or not the funding gap is 343 minus £250 million or whatever the, the current figure is. That would be quite helpful for us to know. Okay, that's a fair we'll, we'll clarify that in the letter that I referred to earlier. I think that would be another part of what I called the jigsaw that would be useful to set out for you. That, that, would, that would be very good. Um, so the 343... Is is based on a revenue cut of one and a half percent, a predicated revenue cut of one and a half percent from Scottish government. Would that be right? Yes, uh, that, that it's an overall reduction in their income, so it's a mix of the two. So it would that would be the the sort of reduction in their income from council tax um, and uh, general revenue grant and NDI. Yes. Oh, so so it does predicate council tax funds. This one then. Yeah. Right. It does. Okay. OK, no, no, I don't actually have any further questions on the table. I just wanted to better understand the table when we go to do our, our overall budget, budget scrutiny. So thank you. I understand why you asked the, the question. What I should say, that you'll, I'm sure you'll have figured this anyway, we're not saying that £343 million figure has any specific significance. We're setting out a range of possibilities there. Um, but you'll, you'll have heard from other parties where they think um, it sits in all of this, and you'll need to form a judgment yourself. But we'll, we'll set out more clearly the assumptions that underlie 
the reductions in income and the increases in expenditure that we've made in, in a supplementary letter to you. No, it was very helpful when, when Cosler gave evidence. They, I yeah. think they said <coughs> that a funding gap was about £580 million, pounds, but that was predicating giving every worker a 3% pay increase, for example, feeding in towards that. And what we're getting clarity on is whether they were including joint board monies or not within within that mix. And I think when he contacted us, just, just to confirm whether it does or or doesn't, Mr Gibson, did you want to...? Point of clarification, the, the cause of figures included a 3% pay rise and 2.8% 2 2 increase, I think, in, in demand pressures as well. You know, so so it's not, you know, obviously because of ageing population and whether it happens to be, so that's how they kind of came to the figures, I think. Yeah, and I think across the top, there are just changes in expenditure. We don't differentiate between inflation, increasing demand or anything. It's just, you know, pick a, pick a number that looks sensible to you and ask what would that mean in terms of a funding gap. But I think it does help the committee from as far as it gives us a almost like a, a baseline table by which to add on additional pressures or add in additional revenues and see how that all kind of interacts with each other. So I, I do. Now that I think I understand it, Exhibit 23, uh, it, it's of value. Thank you very much. On this specific question, because Elaine Smith's been very patient. Elaine Smith. Thanks. But on that specific question, <laughs> could I just clarify, because I'm not clear, the minus 343 that you've picked out, and showed us as an example. Is that just an example to show how the table works? It's not a real figure. OK, thank you. Um, so, yeah, turning to um, paragraph 17 of your report. In paragraph 17, um, you basically say that... Uh, the Scottish Government cause list should assure themselves that the funding formula remains fit for purpose in a changing landscape for local government. I suppose the question is, do you have an opinion on whether it remains fit for purpose? And actually, who, who should actually be looking at this to see if it remains fit for purpose? Uh, OK, so the reason that we've included this, and you'll know this is the first time that we've... Um, ventured into this territory is because we do think that um, transparency and clarity around a very complex arrangement here would be beneficial, and I think that's a view that the committee has expressed in the past. We're not doing this because we think we are experts in the difficulties of local government funding, let alone the complexities of the distribution process that this is just a high-level representation of. So we're not sitting here in front of you as experts on it, and therefore, even if we had an opinion, it probably wouldn't be of any great value to you. But what we do think, having looked at this and reported in the way that we have done, is that it has been some time since there was a kind of fundamental review of this. And we're trying to point out at the top of that um, diagram in Exhibit 4, the number of quite distinct elements that feed into the top part of the process on somebody's spreadsheet that eventually distills out a set of figures that represent real funding to the 32 councils. And those all are quite different to each other. And there's a question, therefore, about how a mixture of things like that, how coherent that is. We're not saying it's not coherent. We just think it's a question worth posing. And also that the, the changes over the 10 years or so since this was last looked at in a fundamental way um, are not just changes in the financial context for local government, but it's also changes in the policy and other context, not just of local government, but Scottish government as well. So against that background, when there's um, a, an aspiration to try to deliver better outcomes for um, the people of Scotland. Whether any funding arrangement, let alone one as significant as this, um, is absolutely fit for purpose, does seem to be to be a valid question to pose. And we're not saying it because we think it's not. We just think after 10 years, you should look at that. A lot has changed in 10 years, and you can see some of that spelled out in that diagram. So we don't have an opinion because we're not experts, but we're advocating um, at least the potential for a look at it, and certainly for the transparency that I think you as a committee and other interested stakeholders have in how all this pans out in local government budgets. OK, and specifically, at the start of that paragraph, you're talking about um, funding. You use the example of it to expand early years childcare, and that's come as additional funding, but it's specifically directed at delivering particular national policies. So... Do you think that, I suppose we just call that ring fencing, but do you think that funding that is specifically for policies that are national policies should be looked at somehow differently then? Is that what you're suggesting at all? 
No, I think what we're saying is that the foundation of this remains what it's always been, which is a needs-based formula to distribute resources in a, in a fashion that is equitable between 32 councils. And if that remains the objective of the, the funding distribution, then it's worth looking at it again to see whether the, the things that have been added to this over the 10-year period or so are genuinely needs-based in that fashion and whether they still represent the best outcome if you're trying to deliver resources to councils so that they can play their part in servicing their local communities and in delivering high-level policy priorities that both councils and the Scottish Government have an interest in. The answer, if you looked at it, might well turn out to be yes, but we think the question is worth posing. I think, Thanks. Sorry, can we just brief? Yeah. I think that our, our core question is a simple one, which is, if there is a, a growing sense that we need to be allocating money for particular purposes in different ways, whether it's the Pupil Equity Fund, whether it's support for early years, then I think that does raise a question as to the core funding formula. In a sense, if the core funding formula was designed to reduce inequality and improve outcomes in the way that the policy framework is now designed to do, you, you could argue that you might not need to have separate revenue streams and additional funding or non-specific changes. So the more you add on to those bits, the more I think it seems to us reasonable to ask the question about the core the core formula in the process. So and I suppose that's our core point. <coughs> okay, now time is almost upon us. Um, so I apologise, Mr Whiteman, that you're going to have to be brief. I'm really hoping we can get the session finished at quarter past, Mr Whiteman. Okay, thank you. A brief follow-up on that. I mean, I think that's helpful. I've been engaging with this in the con uh, as a result of the um, proposed cuts to City of Edinburgh Music School, which were previously ring-fenced in 2008, and then Concordat said they're all wrapped up now in the settlement. Where they are in the settlement is a little bit unclear, so um, exploring that in the future would be useful. I just want to ask a very brief question on Exhibit 5, where you talk about budgetary pressures, uh, single state pension, living, care, living wage for care workers, uh, annual increases in costs, etc., is it your impression that these pressures now are significantly greater than they have ever been over the last decade or so? Just to get some relative impression of the scale of the pressures now being faced? Yeah, others might have a, a more a coherent view than I have on that. Um, I wouldn't say that. I mean, financial pressures, cost pressures, to be more accurate, of one sort or another, uh, an every day and every year fact of local government life. So we haven't looked at this to see whether in 2016-17 they were more or less severe than in previous years. Um, but what I think I can say safely is that um, they're not out of line. They're not extraordinary pressures. So even if they were consistent with previous years, um, against the backdrop of reducing resources, they become harder to deal with. And I think that's the core point that we're making here. Okay. Oh, that was very brief, Mr. Whiteman. I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions from members? Okay. Uh, as always, very helpful. Really, really challenging report. Um, it it better, gives us better skills as, as MSPs on this committee to better scrutinise the budget when the numbers do come out as well. So we very much appreciate that. We look forward to working in partnership with you in, in the months and years ahead. That's the end of this particular evidence session, so thank you very much. Uh, but we now move to agenda item three, which the committee has previously agreed to take in private. So we now move into private session. Thank you.